Chapter Ten of the English Woman in America by Isabella Lucy Bird, read for LibriVox.org into the public domain. Chapter Ten: The people of Toronto informed me immediately on my arrival in their city that Toronto is the most English place to be met with out of England. At first, I was at a loss to understand their meaning. Wooden houses, long streets crossing each other at right angles, and wooden sidewalks looked very un-English to my eye. But when I had been for a few days at Toronto, and had become accustomed to the necessarily unfinished appearance of a town which has only enjoyed sixty years of existence, I fully agreed with the laudatory remarks passed upon it. The wooden houses have altogether disappeared from the principal streets, and have been replaced by substantial erections of brick and stone. The churches are numerous, and of tasteful architecture. The principal edifices are well situated and very handsome. King Street, the principal thoroughfare, is two miles in length, and the sidewalks are lined with handsome shops. The outskirts of Toronto abound in villa residences, standing in gardens or shrubberies. The people do not run hurry-scurry along the streets, but there are no idlers to be observed. Hirsute eccentricities have also disappeared. The beard is rarely seen, and the moustache is not considered a necessary ornament. The faded, careworn look of the American ladies has given place to the bright complexion, the dimpled smile, and the active elastic tread, so peculiarly English. Indeed, in walking along the streets, there is nothing to tell that one is not in England, and if anything were needed to complete the illusion, those sure tokens of British civilization, a jail and a lunatic asylum, are not wanting. Toronto possesses, in a remarkable degree, the appearances of stability and progress. No town on the western continent has progressed more rapidly, certainly none more surely. I conversed with an old gentleman who remembered its site when it was covered with a forest, when the smoke of Indian wigwams ascended through the trees, and when wild fowl crowded the waters of the harbour. The place then bore the name of Toronto, the place of council. The name was changed by the first settlers to Little York, but in 1814 its euphonious name of Toronto was again bestowed upon it. Its population in 1801 was 336. It is now nearly 50,000. Toronto is not the fungus growth, staring and wooden, of a temporary necessity. It is the result of persevering industry, well-applied capital, and healthy and progressive commercial prosperity. Various railroads are in course of construction, which will make the exporting market for the increasing produce of the interior, and as the migratory Canadian legislature is now stationary at Toronto for four years, its future progress will probably be more rapid than its past. Its wharves are always crowded with freight and passenger steamers, by which it communicates two or three times a day with the great cities of the United States, and Quebec and Montreal. It is the seat of Canadian learning, and, besides excellent schools, possesses a university, and several theological and general seminaries. The society is said to be highly superior. I give willing testimony in favour of this assertion, from the little which I saw of it, but an attack of Og prevented me from presenting my letters of introduction. It is a very musical place, and at Toronto Jenny Lind gave the only concerts with which she honoured Canada. A large number of the inhabitants are Scotch, which may account for the admirable way in which the Sabbath is observed. If I was pleased to find that the streets, the stores, the accent, the manners were English, I was rejoiced to see that from the highest to the lowest the hearts of the people were English also. I was at Toronto when the false dispatch was received announcing the capture of Sebastopol and of the Russian army. I was spending the evening at the house of a friend, when a gentleman ran in to say that the church bells were ringing for a great victory. It was but the work of a few minutes for us to jump into a hack, and drive at full speed to the office of the Globe newspaper, where the report was apparently confirmed. A great crowd, in a state of eager excitement, besieged the doors, and presently a man mounted on a lamp-post read the words, "'Sebastopol is taken! The Russian fleet burnt! Eighteen thousand killed and wounded! Loss of the Allies, two thousand five hundred. The news had been telegraphed from Boston, and surely the trembling tongue of steel had never before told such a bloody tale. One shout of, Hurrah for old England, burst from the crowd, and hearty English cheers were given, which were caught up and repeated down the crowded streets of Toronto. The shout thrilled through my heart. It told that the flag of England waved over the loyal, true-hearted, and brave. It told of attachment to the Constitution and the throne. 
It told that in our times of difficulty and danger, St. George and Merry England would prove a gathering cry even on the prosperous shores of Lake Ontario. Greater enthusiasm could not have been exhibited on the receipt of this false but glorious news in any city at home. The bells, which a few days before had tolled for the catastrophe of the Arctic, now pealed forth in triumph for the victory of the Alma. Toronto knew no rest that night. Those who rejoiced over a victory gained over the northern despot were those who had successfully resisted the despotism of a band of rebels. The streets were almost impassable from the crowds who thronged them. Hand-rockets exploded almost into people's eyes, serpents and squibs were hissing and cracking over the pavements, and people were rushing about in all directions for fuel for the different bonfires. The largest of these was opposite the St. Lawrence Hall. It was a monster one of tar-barrels, and lighted up the whole street, paling the sickly flame of the gas-lamps. There was a large and accumulating crowd round it, shouting, Hurrah for old England! Down with the Russians! Three cheers for the Queen! And the like. Sky-rockets were blazing high in the air. Men were rushing about firing muskets. The small swivels of the steamers at the wharves were firing incessantly, and carts with combustibles were going at full speed along the streets, each fresh arrival being hailed with enthusiastic cheering. There were firemen, too, in their picturesque dresses, who had turned out at the first sound of the bells, and their services were soon put into requisition, for enthusiasm produced recklessness, and two or three shingle-roofs were set on fire by the descent of rockets upon them. This display of attachment to England was not confined to the loyal and aristocratic city of Toronto. At Hamilton, a thriving commercial place, of suspected American tendencies, the town council was assembled at the time the dispatch was received, and instantly voted a sum for an illumination. From my praise of Toronto I must accept the hotels, which are of a very inferior class. They are a poor imitation of those in the States. Russell's Hotel, at which I stayed for eight days, was a disagreeable contrast to the National Hotel at Detroit, and another of some pretensions, the North American, was said to be even more comfortless. The bedrooms at Russell's swarmed with mosquitoes, and the waiters, who were runaway slaves, were inattentive and uncivil. After staying some little time with my friends at Toronto, I went to pay a visit to some friends at Hamilton. The afternoon was very windy and stormy. The lake looked very unpromising from the wharf, the island protected the harbour, but beyond this the waves were breaking with fury. Several persons who came down, intending to take their passage for Hamilton, were deterred by the threatening aspect of the weather. But, not having heard anything against the character of Lake Ontario, I had sufficient confidence in it to persevere in my intention. I said to the captain, "'I suppose it won't be rough?' to which he replied that he could not flatter me by saying so, adding that he had never seen so many persons sick as in the morning." Dinner was served immediately on our leaving the harbour, but the number of those who sat down, at first about thirty, soon diminished to five, the others having rushed in a most mysterious manner to state-rooms or windows. For my own part, I cannot say that the allowed excellence of the cuisine tempted me to make a very substantial meal, and I was glad of an excuse for retiring to a state-room, which I shared with a lady who had just taken leave of her three children. This cabin was very prettily arranged, but the movements of things were rather erratic, and my valise gave most disagreeable manifestations of spiritual agency. The ship was making little way, and rolling and pitching fearfully, and knowing how very top-heavy she was, I did not at all like the glimpses of raging water to which I, with difficulty, obtained through the cabin windows. To understand what followed it will be necessary for the reader to recollect that the saloon and staterooms in this vessel formed an erection, or deck-house, about eight feet high upon the deck, and that the part of the saloon where most of the passengers were congregated, as well as the stateroom where I was sitting, were within a few feet of the bow of the ship, and consequently exposed to the fury of the waves. I had sat in my stateroom for half an hour, feeling very apathetic, and wishing myself anywhere but where I was, when something struck the ship, and the wretched fabric fell over on her side. Another and another, then silence for a second, broken only by the crash and roar of winds and waters. The inner door burst open, letting in an inundation of water. My companion jumped up, shrieking, "'Oh, my children, we're lost, we're lost!' and crawled, pale and trembling, into the saloon. The vessel was lying on her side, therefore locomotion was most difficult, but sea-sick people were emerging from their state-rooms, shrieking, 
some that they were lost, others for their children, others for mercy, while the group of gentlemen, less noisy, but not less frightened, and drenched to the skin, were standing together with pale and ashy faces. "'What is the matter?' inquired my companion, taking hold of one of these men. "'Say your prayers, for we're going down,' was the brutal reply. For the first and only time during my American travels I was really petrified with fear. Suddenly a wave struck the hapless vessel, and with a stunning crash broke through the thin woodwork of the side of the saloon. I caught hold of a life-buoy which was near me, a gentleman clutched it from me, for fright makes some men selfish, and breathless I was thrown down into the gurgling water. I learned then how quickly thoughts can pass through the mind, for in those few seconds I thought less of the anticipated death-struggle amid the boiling surges of the lake, and of the quiet sleep beneath its gloomy waters, than of the unsatisfactory manner in which those at home would glean the terrible tidings from the accident columns of a newspaper. Another minute, and I was swept through the open door into a state-room, another of suspense, and the ship righted, as if by superhuman effort. There seemed a respite, there was a silence, broken only by the roar of winds and waves, and with the respite came hope. Shortly after, the master of the ship appeared, with his hat off, and completely drenched. "'Thank God, we're safe,' he said, and returned to his duty. We had all supposed that we had struck on a rock or a wreck. I never knew the precise nature of our danger beyond this, that the vessel had been thrown on her beam-ends in a squall, and that, the wind immediately veering round, the fury of the waves had been spent upon her. Many of the passengers now wished the captain to return, but he said that he should incur great danger in an attempt to make the harbour of Toronto than by proceeding down the open lake. For some time nothing was to be seen but a dense fog, a storm of sleet which quite darkened the air, and raging waves, on which we mounted sometimes, while at others we were buried between them. In another hour the gale had completely subsided, and after we had changed our drenched habiliment, no token remained of the previous storm, but the drowned and dismantled appearance of the saloon, and the resolution, on my own mind, never to trust myself again on one of these fearful lakes. I was amused to observe that those people who had displayed the greatest symptoms of fear during the storm were the first to protest that, as for them, they never thought there was any danger. The afternoon, though cold, was extremely beautiful, but owing to the storm in the early part of our voyage, we did not reach Hamilton till nightfall, or three hours after our appointed time. I do not like these inland lakes, or tideless fresh-water seas, as they may more appropriately be termed. I know Lake Ontario well, I have crossed it twice, and I have been up and down it five times. I have sojourned upon its shores, and I have seen them under the hot light of an autumn sun, and underneath a mantle of wintry snow, but there is to me something peculiarly oppressive about this vast expanse of water. If the lake is rough, there are no harbours of refuge in which to take shelter. If calm, the waters, though pure, blue, and clear, look monotonous and dead. The very ships look lonely things, their hulls and sails are white, and some of them have been known in time of cholera to drift over the lake from day to day, with none to guide the helm. The shores, too, are flat and uninteresting, my eyes wearied of following that interminable boundary of trees stretching away to the distant horizon. Yet Lake Ontario affords great advantages both to Canada and the United States. The former has the large towns of Hamilton, Toronto, and Kingston on its shores, with the exporting places of Oakville, Credit, and Cobourg. The important towns of Oswego and Rochester, with smaller ones too numerous to name, are on the American side. The lake is five hundred miles around, and owing to its very great depth, never freezes, except just along the shores. An immense trade is carried on upon it, both in steamers and sailing vessels. A ship canal connects Lake Ontario with Lake Erie, thereby overcoming the obstacle to navigation produced by the falls of Niagara. This stupendous work is called the Welland Canal. At Hamilton I received a most cordial welcome from the friends whom I went to visit, and saw something of the surrounding country. It is, I think, the most bustling place in Canada. It is a very juvenile city, yet already has a population of twenty-five thousand people. The stores and hotels are handsome, and the streets are brilliantly lighted with gas. Hamilton has a peculiarly unfinished appearance. Indications of progress meet one on every side. There are houses being built, and houses being pulled down to make room for larger and more substantial ones. Streets are being extended, and new ones are being staked out, 
and every external feature seems to be acquiring fresh and rapid development. People hurry about as if their lives depended on their speed. I guess, and I calculate, are frequently heard, together with well-posted up, and a long chalk, and locomotives and steamers whistle all day long. Hamilton is a very Americanized place. I heard of grievances, independence, and annexation, and altogether should have supposed it to be on the other side of the boundary line. It is situated on a little lake, called Burlington Bay, separated from Lake Ontario by a narrow strip of sandy shingle. This has been cut through, and as two steamers leave the pier at Hamilton at the same hour every morning, there is a daily and very exciting race for the first entrance into the narrow passage. This racing is sometimes productive of very serious collisions. The town is built upon very low and augish ground, at the foot of a peculiar and steep eminence, which the inhabitants dignify with the name of the mountain. I ascended this mountain, which might better be called a mole-hill, by a flight of a hundred and thirty steps. The view from the top was very magnificent, but as an elevated building offered us one still more extensive, we ascended to the roof by six flights of steps, to see a camera obscura which was ostentatiously advertised. A very good camera obscura might have been worth so long an ascent in a house redolent of spirits and onions, but after we had reached the top, with a great expenditure of toil and breath, a ragged, shoeless little boy very pompously opened the door of a small wooden erection, and introduced us to four panes of coloured glass, through which we viewed the town of Hamilton, under the different aspects of spring, summer, autumn, and winter. Dundurn Castle, a handsome, castellated, baronial-looking building, the residence of the present premier, Sir Alan McNabb, is near Hamilton, and it has besides some very handsome stone villa residences. There I saw, for the first and only time in the new world, beautifully kept grass lawns, with flower-beds in the English style. One very fine morning, when the maple leaves were tinted with the first scarlet of the fall, my friends took me to see Ancaster and Dundas the former, an old place, very like some of our grey, quiet Lancashire villages, the latter a good type of the rapid development and enterprising spirit which are making Canada West to rival the States in rapidity of progress. There were bridges in course of construction, railway embankments swarming with labourers, macadamized roads succeeding those of corduroy and plank, snake fences giving place to those of post and rails, and stone walls, and saw and grist mills were springing up wherever a water privilege could be found. Laden wagons proceeded heavily along the roads, and the encouraging announcements of cash for wheat and cash for wool were frequently to be seen. The views were very fine as we skirted the mountain, but Canadian scenery is monotonous and rather gloomy, though the glorious tints of the American fall give the leaves of some of the trees the appearance rather of tropical flowers than of foliage. Ancaster is an old place, outstripped by towns of ten years' existence, as it has neither a port nor a river. There was an agricultural show, and monster pumpkins and overgrown cabbages were displayed to admiring crowds, under the shadow of a prodigious Union Jack. Dundas, a near neighbour of Ancaster, has completely eclipsed it. This appears to be one of the busiest little places in Canada West. It is a collection of woollen mills, grist mills, and iron foundries, and though in my preformed notions of political economy I had supposed manufacturers suited exclusively to an old country, in which capital and labour are alike redundant, the aspect of this place was most thriving. In one of the flour mills the machinery seemed as perfect as in the biscuit factory at Portsmouth. By some ingenious mechanism the flour was cooled, barrelled, and branded with great celerity. At an iron foundry I was surprised to find that steam engines and flour mill machinery could not be manufactured fast enough to meet the demand. In this neighbourhood I heard rather an interesting anecdote of what steady perseverance can do in the history of a Scot from the shores of the Forth. This young man was a pauper boy, and was apprenticed to the master of an iron foundry in Scotland, but ran away before the expiration of his apprenticeship, and entering a ship at Glasgow, worked his passage across to Quebec. Here he gained employment for some months as a porter, and having saved a little money, went up to the neighbourhood of Lake Simcoe, where he became a day labourer. Here he fell in love with his master's daughter, who returned his affection, but her father scornfully rejected the humble Scotchman's suit. Love but added an incentive to ambition, and obtaining work in a neighbouring township, he increased his income by teaching reading, writing, and arithmetic in the evenings. 
He lived penuriously, denied himself even necessities, and carefully treasured his hoarded savings. Late one evening, clothed almost in rags, he sought out the house of his lady love, and told her that within two years he would come to claim her hand of her father, with a wagon and a pair of horses. Still in his ragged clothing, for it does not appear that he had any other, he trudged to Toronto and sought employment, his accumulated savings sewn up in the lining of his waistcoat. He went about from person to person, but could not obtain employment, and his wagon and horses receded further and further in the dim perspective. One day, while walking along at the unfinished end of King Street West, he saw something glittering in the mud, and on taking it up found it to be the steel snap of a pocket-book. This pocket-book contained notes to the amount of one hundred and fifty dollars, and the next day a reward of five-and-twenty was offered to the finder of them. The Scotchman waited on the owner, who was a tool manufacturer, and declining the reward, asked only for work, for leave to toil, as Burns has expressed it. This was granted him, and in less than four months he became a clerk in the establishment. His salary was gradually raised. In the evenings he obtained employment in writing for a lawyer, and his savings, judiciously managed, increased to such an extent that at the end of eighteen months he purchased a thriving farm in the neighborhood of London, and, as there was water-power upon it, he built a grist-mill. His industry still continued successful, and just before the two years expired he drove in a light wagon, with two hardy Canadian horses, to the dwelling of his former master, to claim his daughter's hand, though, be it remembered, he had never held any communication with her since he parted from her in rags two years before. At first they did not recognize the vagrant, ragged Scotch laborer in the well-dressed driver and possessor of the knowing-looking equipage. His altered circumstances removed all difficulty on the father's part. The maiden had been constant, and soon afterwards they were married. He still continued to prosper, and added land to land, and three years after his marriage sent twenty pounds to his former master in Scotland as a compensation for the loss of his services. Strange to say, the son of that very master is now employed in the mill of the runaway apprentice. Such instances as this, while they afford encouragement to honest industry, show at the same time the great capabilities of Canada West. At Hamilton, where the stores are excellent, I made several purchases, but I was extremely puzzled with the Canadian currency. The state's money is very convenient. I soon understood dollars, cents, and dimes, but in the colonies I never knew what my money was worth. In Prince Edward Island the sovereign is worth thirty shillings, in New Brunswick and Nova Scotia twenty-five, while in Canada, at the time of my visit, it was worth twenty-four and fourpence. There your shilling is fifteen pence, or a quarter dollar, while your quarter dollar is a shilling. Your sixpence is seven pence halfpenny, or a York shilling, while your penny is a copper of indeterminate value, apparently. Comparatively speaking, very little metallic money is in circulation. You receive bills marked five shillings, when, to your surprise, you can only change them for four metallic shillings. Altogether, in Canada, I had to rely upon people's honesty, or probably on their ignorance of my ignorance, for any attempts at explanation only made confusion worse confounded, and I seldom comprehended anything of a higher grade than a York shilling. From my stupidity about the currency, and my frequent query, how many dollars or cents is it, together with my offering dirty, crumpled pieces of paper bearing such names as Troy, Palmyra, and Geneva, which were in fact notes of American banks which might have suspended payment, I was constantly taken, not for an ignoramus from the old country, but for a genuine down-easter. Canadian credit is excellent, but the banking system of the States is on a very insecure footing. Some bank or other breaks every day, and lists of the defaulters are posted up in the steamboats and hotels. Within a few days after my resolution never again to trust myself on Lake Ontario, I sailed down it, on a very beautiful morning, to Toronto. The Royal Mail Steamer Arabian raced with us for the narrow entrance to the canal, which connects Burlington Bay with the main lake, and both captains piled on to their utmost ability, but the Arabian passed us in triumph. The morning was so very fine that I half forgot my dislike to Lake Ontario, on the land side there was a succession of slightly elevated promontories, covered with forests abounding in recent clearings, their sombre colouring being relieved by the brilliant blue of the lake. I saw, for the only time, that beautiful phenomenon called the water mirage, by which trees, ships, and houses are placed in the most extraordinary and sometimes inverted positions. Yet still these endless promontories stretched away, 
till their distant outlines were lost in the soft blue haze of the Indian summer. Yet there was an oppressiveness about the tideless water and pestilential shore, and the white hulled ships looked like deserted, punished things, whose doom for ages was to be ceaselessly sailing over these gloomy waters. At Toronto my kind friend Mr. Forrest met me. He and his wife had invited me some months before to visit them in their distant home in the Canadian bush. Therefore I was not a little surprised at the equipage which awaited me at the hotel, as I had expected to jolt for twenty-two miles over corduroy roads in a lumber-wagon. It was the most dashing vehicle which I saw in Canada. It was a most unbush-like, sporting-looking, high male phaeton, mounted by four steps. It had three seats, a hood in front, and a rack for luggage behind. It would hold eight persons. The body and wheels were painted bright scarlet and black, and it was drawn by a pair of very showy-looking horses, about sixteen hands high, with elegant and well-blacked harness. Mr. Forrest looked more like a sporting English squire than an emigrant. We drove out of Toronto by the Lake Shore Road, and I could scarcely believe we were not by the sea, for a heavy surf was rolling and crashing upon the beach, and no land was in sight on the opposite side. After some time we came to a stream, with a most clumsy swing-bridge, which was open for the passage of two huge rafts laden with flour. This proceeding had already occupied more than an hour, as we were informed by some unfortunate detenues. We waited for half an hour while the raftmen dwaddled about, but the rafts could not get through the surf, so they were obliged to desist. I now reasonably supposed that they would have shut the bridge as fast as possible, as about twenty vehicles, with numerous foot-passengers, were waiting on either side. But no, they moved it for a little distance, then smoked a bit, then moved it a few inches and smoked again, and so on for another half-hour, while we were exposed to a pitiless north-east wind. They evidently enjoyed our discomfiture, and were trying to see how much of an annoyance we would bear patiently. Fiery tempers have to be curbed in Canada West, for the same spirit which at home leads men not to touch their hats to those above them in station, here would vent itself in open insolence and arrogance, if one requested them to be a little quicker in their motions. The fabric would hardly come together at all, and then only three joists appeared without anything to cover them. This the men seemed to consider un fait accompli, and sat down to smoke. At length, when it seemed impossible to bear a longer detention with any semblance of patience, they covered these joists with some planks, over which our horses, used to pick their way, passed in safety, not, however, without overturning one of the boards, and leaving a most dangerous gap. This was a favourable specimen of a Canadian bridge. The manners of the emigrants who settle in Canada are far from prepossessing. Wherever I heard torrents of slang and abuse of England, wherever I noticed brutality of manner, unaccompanied by respect to ladies, I always found upon inquiry that the delinquent had newly arrived from the old country. Some time before I visited America, I saw a letter from a young man who had emigrated, containing these words, Here I haven't to bow and cringe to gentlemen of the aristocracy, that is, to a man who has a better coat on than myself. I was not prepared to find this feeling so very prevalent among the lower classes in our own possessions. The children are an improvement on their parents, and develop loyal and constitutional sentiments. The Irish are the noisiest of the enemies of England, and carry with them to Canada the most inveterate enmity to Sassanach rule. The term slang-wangers must have been invented for these. After some miles of very bad road, which had once been corduroy, we got upon a plank road, upon which the draught is nearly as light as upon a railroad. When these roads are good, the driving upon them is very easy. When they are out of repair, it is just the reverse. We came to an Indian village of clapboard houses, built some years ago by the government for some families of the Six Nations, who resided here with their chief. But they disliked the advances of the white man, and their remnants have removed farther to the west. We drove for many miles through woods of the American oak, little more than brushwood, but gorgeous in all shades of colouring, from the scarlet of the geranium to deep crimson and Tyrian purple. Oh, our poor, faded tints of autumn, about which we write sentimental poetry! Turning sharply around a bank of moss, and descending a long hill, we entered the bush. There all my dreams of Canadian scenery were more than realised. Trees grew in every variety of the picturesque. The forest was dark and oppressively still, and such a deadly chill came on, that I drew my cloak closer round me. A fragrant but heavy smell arose, and Mr. Forrest said that we were going down into a cedar swamp, where there was a chill even in the hottest weather. 
It was very beautiful. Emerging from this, we came upon a little whitewashed English church, standing upon a steep knoll, with its little spire rising through the trees, and leaving this behind, we turned off upon a road through very wild country. The ground had once been cleared, but no use had been made of it, and it was covered with charred stumps about two feet high. Beyond this appeared an interminable bush. Mr. Forrest told me that his house was near, and from the appearance of the country I expected to come upon a log cabin, but we turned into a field and drove under some very fine apple trees to a house the very perfection of elegance and comfort. It looked as if a pretty villa from Northwood or Hampstead had been transported to this Canadian clearing. The dwelling was a substantially built brick one-storied house, with a deep green veranda surrounding it, as a protection from the snow in winter and the heat in summer. Apple trees, laden with richly colored fruit, were planted round, and sumac trees, in all the glorious coloring of the fall, were opposite the front door. The very house seemed to smile a welcome, and seldom have I met a more cordial one than I received from Mrs. Forrest, the kindly and graceful hostess, who met me at the door, her pretty, simple dress of pink and white muslin contrasting strangely with the charred stumps which were in sight, and the long lines of gloomy bush which stood out dark and sharp against the evening sky. "'Will you go into the drawing-room?' asked Mrs. Forrest. I was surprised, for I had not associated a drawing-room with emigrant life in Canada, but I followed her along a pretty entrance-lobby, floored with polished oak, into a lofty room, furnished with all the elegances and luxuries of the mansion of an affluent Englishman at home, a beautiful piano not being wanting. It was in this house, containing every comfort, and welcomed with the kindest hospitality, that I received my first impressions of life in the clearings. My hosts were only recovering from the fatigues of a thrashing-bee of the day before, and while we were playing at Bagatelle, one of the gentlemen assistants came to the door, and asked if the boss were at home. A lady told me that, when she first came out, a servant asked her how the boss liked his shirts done. As Mrs. Moody had not then enlightened the world on the subject of settler slang, the lady did not understand her, and asked what she meant by the boss, to which she replied, "'Why, lock, Mrs., your hubby, to be sure.' I spent some time with these kind and most agreeable friends, and returned to them after a visit to the Falls of Niagara. My sojourn with them is among my sunniest memories of Canada." Though my expectations were in one sense entirely disappointed on awakening to the pleasant consciousness of reposing on the softest of feathers, I did not feel romance enough to wish myself on a buffalo robe on the floor of a log cabin. Nearly every day I saw some operation of Canadian farming, with its difficulties and pleasures. Among the former is that of obtaining men to do the work. The wages given are five shillings per diem, and in many cases rations besides. While I was at Mr. Forrest's, two men were sinking a well, and one coolly took up his tools and walked away, because only half a pound of butter had been allowed for breakfast. Mr. Forrest possesses sixty acres of land, fifteen of which are still in bush. The barns are very large and substantial, more so than at home, for no produce can be left out of doors in the winter. There were two hundred and fifty bushels of wheat, the produce of a thrashing bee, and various other edibles. Oxen, huge and powerful, do all the draft work on this farm, and their stable looked the very perfection of comfort. Round the house snake fences had given place to those of post and rail, but a few hundred yards away was the uncleared bush. The land thus railed around had been cleared for some years, the grass is good, and the stumps few in number. Leaving this, we came to the stubble of last year, where the stumps were more numerous, and then to the land only cleared in the spring, covered thickly with charred stumps the soil rich and black, and wheat springing up in all directions. Beyond this there was nothing but bush. A scramble through a bush, though very interesting in its way, produces disagreeable consequences. When the excitement of the novelty was over, and I returned to the house, I contemplated with very woeful feelings the inroad which had been made upon my wardrobe, the garments torn in all directions beyond any possibility of repair, and the shoes reduced to the consistency of soaked brown paper, with wading through a bog. It was a serious consideration to me, who at that time was travelling through the West with a very small and very way-worn portmanteau, with Glasgow, Torquay, Boston, Rock Island, and I know not what besides upon it. The bush, however, for the time being, was very enjoyable, in spite of numerous bruises and scratches. Huge pines raised their heads to heaven, 
others lay prostrate and rotting away, probably thrown down in some tornado. In the distance numbers of trees were lying on the ground, and men were cutting off their branches and burning them in heaps, which slowly smouldered away, and sent up clouds of curling blue smoke, which diffused itself as a thin blue veil over the dark pines. This bush is in dangerous proximity to Mr. Forrest's house. The fire ran through it in the spring, and many of the trees, which are still standing, are blackened by its effects. One night in April, after a prolonged drought, just as the household were retiring to rest, Mr. Forrest looked out of the window, and saw a light in the bush scarcely bigger or brighter than a glow-worm. Presently it rushed up a tall pine, entwining its fiery arms round the very highest branches. The fire burned on for a fortnight. They knew it must burn till rain came, and Mr. Forrest and his man never left it day or night, all their food being carried to the bush. One night, during a breeze, it made a sudden rush towards the house. In a twinkling they got out the oxen and plough, and some of the neighbours coming to their assistance, they ploughed up so much soil between the fire and the stubble round the house that it stopped, but not before Mr. Forrest's straw hat was burnt and the hair of the oxen singed. Mrs. Forrest, meanwhile, though trembling for her husband's safety, was occupied in wetting blankets, and carrying them to the roof of the house, for the dry shingles would have been ignited by a spark. On our return it was necessary to climb over some snake or zigzag fences about six feet high. These fences are peculiar to new countries, and, though very cheap, requiring neither tools nor nails, have a peculiarly untidy appearance. It is not thought wise to buy a farm which has not enough bush or growing timber for both rails and firewood. In clearing, of which I saw all the processes, the first is to cut down the trees, in which difficult operation axes of British manufacture are rendered useless after a few hours' work. The trees are cut about two feet above the roof, and often bring others down with them in their fall. Sometimes these trees are split up at the time into rails or firewood, sometimes dragged to the sawmills to be made into lumber, but are often piled into heaps and burnt, a necessary but prodigal waste of wood, to which I never became reconciled. When the wood has been cleared off, wheat is sown among the stumps, and then grass, which appears only to last about four years. Fire is put on the tops of these unsightly stumps to burn them down as much as possible, and when it is supposed, after two or three years, that the roots have rotted in the ground, several oxen are attached by a chain to each, and pull it out. Generally this is done by means of a logging bee. I must explain this term, as it refers neither to the industrious insect, nor the imperial bee of Napoleon. The very name reminds me of early rising, healthy activity, merriment, and a well-spread board. A bee is a necessity arising from the great scarcity of labor in the new world. When a person wishes to thrash his corn, he gives notice to eight or ten of his neighbors, and a day is appointed, on which they are to meet at his house. For two or three days before, grand culinary preparations are made by the hostess, and on the preceding evening a table is loaded with provisions. The morning comes, and eight or ten stalwart Saxons make their appearance, and work hard till noon, while the lady of the house is engaged in hotter work before the fire, in the preparation of hot meat, puddings, and pies, for, well, she knows that the good humour of her guests depends on the quantity and quality of her viands. They come into dinner, black from the dust of a peculiar Canadian weed, hot, tired, hungry, and thirsty. They eat as no other people eat, and set all our notions of the separability of different viands at a defiance. At the end of the day they have a very substantial supper, with plenty of whiskey, and if everything has been satisfactory, the convivial proceedings are prolonged till past midnight. The giver of a bee is bound to attend the bees of all his neighbors. A thrashing bee is considered very slow affair by the younger portion of the community. There are quilting bees, where the thick quilts, so necessary in Canada, are fabricated, apple bees, where this fruit is sliced and strung for the winter, shelling bees, where peas and bushels are shelled and barreled, and logging bees, where the decayed stumps in the clearings are rooted up by oxen. At the quilting, apple, and shelling bees there are numbers of the fair sex, and games, dancing, and merry-making are invariably kept up till the morning. In the winter, as in the eastern colonies, all outdoor employments are stopped, and dancing and evening parties of different kinds are continually given. The whole country is like one vast road, and the fine, cold, aurora-lighted nights are cheery with the lively sound of the sleigh-bells, as merry parties, enveloped in furs, 
drive briskly over the crisp surface of the snow. The way of life at Mr. Forrest's was peculiarly agreeable. The breakfast hour was nominally seven, and afterwards Mr. Forrest went out to his farm. The one Irish servant, who never seemed happy with her shoes on, was capable of little else than boiling potatoes, so all the preparations for dinner devolved upon Mrs. Forrest, who, till she came to Canada, had never attempted anything in the culinary line. I used to accompany her into the kitchen, and learned how to solve the problem which puzzled an English king, viz., how apples get into a dumpling. We dined at the medieval hour of twelve, and everything was of home raising. Fresh meat is a rarity, but a calf had been killed, and furnished dinners for seven days, and the most marvellous thing was that each day it was dressed in a different manner, Mrs. Forrest's skill in this respect rivalling that of Alexis Sawyer. A home-fed pig, one of eleven slaughtered on one fell day, produced the excellent ham, the squash and potatoes were from the garden, and the bread and beer were from home-grown wheat and hops. After dinner Mr. Forrest and I used to take lengthy rides, along wild roads, on horses of extraordinary capabilities, and in the evenings we used to have bagatelle and reading aloud. Such was life in the clearings. On one or two evenings some very agreeable neighbours came in, and in addition to bagatelle we had puzzles, conundrums, and conjuring tricks. One of these neighbours was a young married lady, the prettiest person I had seen in America. She was a French-Canadian, and added to the graces of person and manner for which they are famed, a cleverness and sprightliness peculiarly her own. I was very much pleased with the friendly, agreeable society of the neighbourhood. There are a great many gentlemen residing there, with fixed incomes, who have adopted Canada as their home because of the comforts which they can enjoy in an untaxed country, and one in which it is not necessary to keep up appearances. For instance, a gentleman does not lose caste by grooming his own horse, or driving his own produce to market in a lumber wagon, and a lady is not less a lady, though she may wear a dress and bonnet of a fashion three years old. I was surprised one morning by the phenomenon of some morning callers, yes, morning callers in a Canadian clearing. I sighed to think that such a pest and accompaniment of civilization should have crossed the Atlantic. The callers of that morning, the Haldemans, amused me very much. They give themselves great airs. Canada, with them, is a wretched hole. The society is composed of boors. In a few minutes they had asked me who I was, where I came from, what I was doing there, how I got to know my friends, and if I had come to live with them. Mr. Haldemans, finding I came from England, asked me if I knew a certain beautiful young lady, and recounted his flirtations with her. Dukes, earls, and viscounts flowed from his nimble tongue. When I was hunting with Lord this, or when I was waltzing with Lady that. His regrets were after the opera and Almax, and his hide of felicity seemed to be driving a four-in-hand drag. After expatiating to me in the most vociferous manner on the delights of titled society, he turned to Mrs. Forrest and said, After the society in which we used to move, you may imagine how distasteful all this is to us. Barely a civil speech, I thought. This eccentric individual was taking a lady, whom he considered a person of consequence, for a drive in a carriage, when a man driving a lumber-wagon kept crossing the road in front of him, hindering his progress. Mr. Haldemans gradually got into a towering passion, which resulted in his springing out, throwing the reins to the lady, and rushing furiously at the teamster with his fists squared, shouting in a perfect scream, "'Flesh and blood can't bear this! One of us must die!' The man whipped up his horses and made off, and Mr. Haldemans tried in vain to hush up a story which made him appear so superlatively ridiculous. We actually paid some morning visits, and I thought the society very agreeable and free from gossip. One of our visits was paid to the family of one of the oldest settlers in Canada. His place was the very perfection of beauty. It was built in a park formed out of a civilized wood, the grounds extending to the verge of a precipice, looking from which I saw the river, sometimes glittering in the sunshine, sometimes foaming along in a wood, just realizing Mrs. Moody's charming description of the Otanabe. Far below, the water glittered like diamond sparks among the dark woods. Pines had fallen into and across it, in the same way in which trees only fall in America, and no two trees were of the same tint. The wild vine hung over the precipice, and smothered the trees with its clusters and tendrils, and hurriedly, in some places, gently in others, the cold rivulet flowed down to the lake, no bold speculator having, as yet, dared to turn the water privilege to account." 
My first ride was an amusing one, for various reasons. My riding habit was left at Toronto, but this seemed not to be a difficulty. Mrs. Forrest's fashionable habit and white gauntlet gloves fitted me beautifully, and the difficulty about a hat was at once overcome by sending to an obliging neighbor, who politely sent a very stylish-looking, plumed riding hat. There was a side-saddle and a most elegant bridle. Indeed, the whole equipment would not have disgraced Rotten Row. But the horse! My courage had to be screwed to the sticking-point before I could mount him. He was a very fine animal, a magnificent coal-black charger sixteen hands high, with a most determined will of his own, not broken for the saddle. Mr. Forrest rode a splendid bay, which seldom went over six consecutive yards of ground without performing some erratic movement. My horse's paces were a tremendous trot, breaking sometimes into a furious gallop, in both which he acted in a perfectly independent manner, any attempts of mine to control him with my whole strength and weight being alike useless. We came to the top of a precipice overlooking the river, where his gyrations were so fearful that I turned him into the bush. It appeared to me a ride of imminent dangers and hair-breadth escapes. By this beauteous river we came to a place where rain and flood had worn the precipice into a steep declivity, shelving towards another precipice, and my horse, accustomed to it, took me down where an English donkey would scarcely have ventured. Beauty might be written upon everything in this dell. I never saw a fairer compound of rock, wood, and water. Above was flat and comparatively uninteresting country. Then these precipices, with trees growing out wherever they could find a footing, arrayed in all the gorgeous colouring of the American fall. At the foot of these was a narrow, bright green savannah, with fine trees growing upon it, as though planted by some one anxious to produce a park-like effect. Above this the dell contracted to the width of Dovedale, and, through it all, the river, sometimes a foaming, brawling stream, at others fringed with flowers, and quiescent in deep, clear pools, pours down to the lake. After galloping upon the savannah we plunged into the river, and after our horses had broken through a plank bridge at the great risk of their legs, we rode for many miles through bush and clearing, down sandy tracks and scratching thickets, to the pebbly beach of Lake Ontario. The contrast between the horses and their equipments, and the country we rode through, was somewhat singular. The former were suitable for Hyde Park, the latter was mere bush-riding, climbing down precipices, fording rapid rivers, scrambling through fences and over timber, floundering in mud, going through the bush with hands before us to push the branches from our faces, and finally watering our horses in the deep blue waters of Lake Ontario. Yet I never enjoyed a ride along the green lanes of England so much as this one in the wild scenery of Canada. The Sundays that I spent at Mr. Forrest's were very enjoyable, though the heat of the first was nearly insupportable, and the cold of the last like that of an English Christmas in bygone years. There are multitudes of Presbyterians in western Canada, who worship in their pure and simple faith with as much fervency and sincerity as did their covenanting forefathers in the days of the persecuting Dundee and the quaint old psalms, to which they are so much attached, sung to the strange old tunes, sound to them as sweet among the backwoods of Canada as in the peaceful villages of the lowlands, or in the remote highland glens, where I have often listened to their slow and plaintive strains, borne upon the mountain breezes. "'Are ye frae the braes of Glenifar?' said an old Scotchwoman to me. "'Were ye at our kirk o' Sabbath last, ye wouldna ken the difference. The Irishman declaims against the land he has forsaken, the Englishman too often suffers the remembrance of his poverty to sever the tie which binds him to the land of his birth, but where shall we find the Scotchman in whose breast love of his country is not a prominent feeling? Whether it be the light-haired Saxons from the south, or the dark-haired, sallow-visaged Celt from the highlands, driven forth by the gaunt hand of famine, all look back to Scotland as to their country. The mention of its name kindles animation in the dim eye of age, and causes the bounding heart of youth to leap with enthusiasm. It may be that the Scotch emigrant's only remembrance is of the cold hut on the lone hillside, where years wore away in poverty and hunger, but to him it is the dearest spot of earth. It may be that he has attained a competence in Canada, and that its fertile soil produces crops which the heathery braes of Scotland could never yield. No matter, it is yet his home. It is the land where his fathers sleep, it is the land of his birth. His dreams are of the mountain and of the flood, of lonely locks and mountain-girded firths, 
and when the purple light on a summer evening streams over the forest, he fancies that the same beams are falling on Morven and the Cullochlins, and that the soft sound pervading the air is the echo of the shepherd's pipe. To the latest hour of his life he cherishes the idea of returning to some homestead by a tumbling burney. He can never bring himself to utter, to his mountain land, from the depths of his heart, the melancholy words, Chetilna Tui, we return no more. The Episcopal Church was only two miles from us, but we were most mercifully jolted over a plank road, where many of the planks had made a descent into a sea of mud, on the depth of which I did not attempt to speculate. Even in beautiful England I never saw a prettier sight than the assemblage of the congregation. The church is built upon a very steep little knoll, the base of which is nearly encircled by a river. Close to it is a long shed, in which the horses are tethered during service, and little belligerent sounds, such as screaming and kicking, occasionally find their way into church. The building is light and pretty inside, very simple but excellent in taste, and though there is no organ, the singing and chanting, conducted by the younger portion of the congregation, is on par with some of the best in our town churches at home. There were no persons poorly clad, and all looked happy, sturdy, and independent. The bright scarlet leaves of the oak and maple pressed against the windows, giving them in the sunlight something of the appearance of stained glass. The rippling of the river was heard below, and round us, far, far away, stretched the forest. Here, where the great Manitou was once worshipped, a purer faith now reigns, and the allegiance of the people is more firmly established by the sound of the church-going bells, than by the bayonets of our troops. These heaven-pointing spires are links between Canada and England. They remind the immigrant of the ivy-mantled church in which he was first taught to bend his knees to his Creator, and of the hallowed dust around its walls, where the sacred ashes of his fathers sleep. There is great attachment to England among those who are protected by her laws, and live under the shadow of her standard of freedom. In many instances no remembrances of wrongs received, of injuries sustained, of hopeless poverty and ill-requited toil, can sever that holiest, most sacred of ties, which binds, until his last breath, the heart of the exile to his native land. The great annoyance of which the people complain in this pleasant land is the difficulty of obtaining domestic servants, and the extraordinary specimens of humanity who go out in this capacity. It is difficult to obtain any, and those that are procured are solely Irish Roman Catholics, who think it a great hardship to wear shoes, and speak of their master as the boss. At one house where I visited, the servant, or help, after condescending to bring in the dinner, took a book from the chiffonier and sat down on the sofa to read it. On being remonstrated with for her conduct, she replied that she would not remain an hour in a house where those she helped had an objection to a young lady's improving her mind. At an hotel in Toronto, one chambermaid, pointing to another, said, "'That young lady will show you your room.' I left Mr. Forrest even for three days with great regret, and after a nine miles' drive on a very wet morning, and a water transit of two hours, found myself at Toronto, where, as usual, on the wharf I was greeted with the clamorous demand for wharfage. I found the Walrences and other agreeable acquaintances at Russell's Hotel, but was surprised with what I thought rather a want of a discrimination on the part of all. I was showing a valuable collection of autographs, beginning with Cromwell, and containing, in addition to those of several deceased and living royal personages, valuable letters of Scott, Byron, Wellington, Russell, Palmerston, Wilberforce, Dickens, etc. The shades of kings, statesmen, and poets might almost have been incited to appear, when the signature of Richard Cobden was preferred before all. End of chapter 10. Read by Sibella Denton. For more information, please visit LibriVox.org. Woman in America by Isabella Lucy Bird. Read for LibriVox.org into the public domain. Chapter 11. Have you seen the falls? No. Then you've seen nothing of America. I might have seen Trenton Falls, Genesee Falls, the falls of Montmorency and Lorette, but I had seen nothing if I had not seen the falls, par excellence, of Niagara. There were diverse reasons why my friends in the States were anxious that I should see Niagara. 
One was, as I was frequently told, that all I had seen, even to the prayer eyes, would go for nothing on my return, for in England America was supposed to be a vast tract of country containing one town, New York, and one astonishing natural phenomenon, called Niagara. See, New York, Quebec, and Niagara was the direction I received when I started upon my travels. I never could make out how, but somehow or other, from my earliest infancy, I had been familiar with the name of Niagara, and from the numerous pictures I had seen of it, I could, I supposed, have sketched a very accurate likeness of the Horseshoe Fall. Since I landed at Portland, I had continually met with people who went into ecstatic raptures with Niagara, and after passing within sight of its spray, and within hearing of its roar, after seeing it the great centre of attraction to all persons of every class, my desire to see it for myself became absorbing. Numerous difficulties had arisen, and at one time I had reluctantly given up all hope of seeing it, when Mr. and Mrs. Walrence kindly said that if I would go with them, they would return to the east by way of Niagara. Between the anticipation of this event and the din of the rejoicings for the capture of Sebastopol, I slept very little on the night before leaving Toronto, and was by no means sorry when the cold grey of dawn quenched the light of tar-barrels and gas-lamps. I crossed Lake Ontario in the iron steamer Peerless. The lake was rough, as usual, and after a promenade of two hours on the spray-drenched deck, I retired to the cabin, and spent some time in dreamily wondering whether Niagara itself would compensate for the discomforts of the journey thither. Captain D. gravely informed me that there were a good many cases below, and I never saw people so deplorably seasick as in this steamer. An Indian officer who had crossed the line seventeen times was seasick for the first time on Lake Ontario. The short, cross, chopping seas affect most people. The only persons in the saloon who were not discomposed by them were two tall schoolgirls, who seemed to have innumerable whispered confidences and secrets to confide to each other. We touched the wharf at Niagara, a town on the British side of the Niagara River, cars for Buffalo all aboard, and just crossing a platform we entered the Canada cars, and on the top of some frightful precipices, and round some terrific curves, we were whirled to the Clifton House at Niagara. I left the cars, and walked down the slope of the verge of the cliff. I forgot my friends, who had called me to the hotel to lunch. I forgot everything, for I was looking at the falls of Niagara. No more than this, what seemed it now, by that far flood to stand. A thousand streams of lovelier flow bathe my own mountain land, and thence o'er waste and ocean track their wild sweet voices called me back. They called me back to many a glade, my childhood haunt of play, where brightly mid the birchen shade their waters glanced away. They called me with their thousand waves back to my father's hills and graves. The feelings which Mrs. Hemans had attributed to Bruce at the source of the Nile were mine as I took my first view of Niagara. The horseshoe fall at some distance to my right was partially hidden, but directly in front of me were the American and Crescent Falls. The former is perfectly straight, and looked like a gigantic millware. This resemblance is further heightened by an enormous wooden many-windowed fabric, said to be the largest paper mill in the United States. A whole collection of mills disfigures this romantic spot, which has received the name of Manchester, and bids fair to become a thriving manufacturing town. Even on the British side, where one would have hoped for a better state of things, there is a great fungus growth of museums, curiosity shops, taverns, and pagodas with shining tin cupolas. Not far from where I stood, the members of a picnic party were flirting and laughing hilariously, throwing chicken bones and peach stones over the cliff, drinking champagne and soda water. Just as I had succeeded in attaining the proper degree of mental abstraction with which it is necessary to contemplate Niagara, a ragged drosky driver came up. "'Your Honour, may be you're in want of a carriage? I'll take you the whole round. Goat Island, Whirlpool, and Deal's Hole, for the matter of four dollars.' Niagara made a matter of a round, dollars and cents, was too much for my equanimity, and in the hope of losing my feelings of disappointment, I went into the Clifton House, enduring a whole volley of requests from the half-tipsy drosky drivers who thronged the doorway. This celebrated hotel, which is kept on the American plan, is a huge white block of building, 
with three green verandas round it, and can accommodate about four hundred people. In the summer season it is the abode of a most unparalleled gaiety. Here congregate tourists, merchants, lawyers, officers, senators, wealthy southerners, and sallow down-easters, all flying alike from business and heat. Here meet all ranks, those of the highest character, and those who have no character to lose, those who by some fortunate accident have become possessed of a few dollars, and those whose mine of wealth lies in the gambling-house, all for the time being on terms of perfect equality. Balls, indoors and out of doors, nightly succeed to parties and picnics, the most novel of which are those in the beautiful garden in front of the hotel. This garden has spacious lawns lighted by lamps, and here, as in the midsummer night's dream, the visitors dance on summer evenings to the strains of invisible music. But at the time of my second visit to the falls all the gaiety was over, the men of business had returned to the cities, the southerners had fled to their sunny homes, part of the house was shut up, and in the great dining-room, with tables for three hundred, we sat down to lunch with about twenty-five persons, most of them Americans and Germans of the most repulsive description. After this meal, eaten in the five minutes all aboard style, we started on a sight-seeing expedition. Instead of being allowed to sit quietly on Table Rock, gazing upon the cataract, the visitor, yielding to the demands of a supposed necessity, is dragged a weary round. He must see the falls from the front, from above, and from below. He must go behind them, and be drenched by them. He must descend spiral staircases at the risk of his limbs, and cross ferries at that of his life. He must visit Bloody Run, the Burning Springs, and Indian Curiosity Shops, which have nothing to do with them at all. And, when the poor wretch is thoroughly bewildered and wearied by doing Niagara, he is allowed to steal quietly off to what he really came to see, the mighty horseshoe fall, with all its accompaniments of majesty, sublimity, and terror. Round the door of the Clifton House were about twenty ragged, vociferous drosky-drivers, of most demoralized appearance, all clamorous for a fare. "'We want to go to Goat Island. How much is it? Five dollars. I'll take you for four and a half. "'No, sir, he's a cheat and a blackguard. I'll take you for four. "'I'll take you as cheap as any one, shouts a man in rags. I'll take you for three. "'Very well. I'll take you as cheap as he. He's drunk, and his carriage isn't fit for a lady to step into.' shouted the man who had at first asked five dollars. After this they commenced a regular melee, when blows were given and received, and frequent allusions were made to the bones of St. Patrick. At last our friend in rags succeeded in driving up to the door, and we found his carriage really unfit for ladies, as the stuffing in most places was quite bare, and the step and splashboards were only kept in their place by pieces of rope. The shouting and squabbling were accompanied by Niagara, whose deep, awful, thundering bass drowns all other sounds. We drove for two miles along the precipice bank of the Niagara River. This precipice is two hundred and fifty feet high, without a parapet, and the green, deep flood rages below. At the suspension bridge they demanded a toll of sixty cents, and contemptuously refused two five-dollar notes offered to them by Mr. Walrens, saying they were only waste paper. This extraordinary bridge, over which a train of cars weighing four hundred and forty tons has recently passed, has a span of eight hundred feet, and a double roadway, the upper one being used by the railway. The floor of the bridge is two hundred and thirty feet above the river, and the depth of the river immediately under it is two hundred and fifty feet. The view from it is magnificent. To the left the furious river, confined in a narrow space, rushes in rapids to the whirlpool, and to the right the horseshoe fall pours its torrent of waters into the dark and ever-invisible abyss. When we reached the American side we had to declare to a custom-house officer that we were no smugglers, and then, by an awful road, partly covered with stumps and partly full of holes, over the one and through the other, our half-tipsy driver jolted us, till we wished ourselves a thousand miles from Niagara. "'There now, Faith, and wasn't I nearly done for myself?' he exclaimed, as a jolt threw him from his seat, nearly over the dashboard. We passed through the town bearing the names of Niagara Falls and Manchester, an agglomeration of tea-gardens, curiosity-shops, and monster hotels, with domes of shining tin. We drove down a steep hill, and crossed a very insecure-looking wooden bridge to a small wooded island, where a man with a strong nasal twang demanded a toll of twenty-five cents, and anon we crossed a long bridge over the lesser rapids. 
The cloudy morning had given place to a glorious day, abounding in varieties of light and shade. A slight shower had fallen, and the sparkling raindrops hung from every leaf and twig. A rainbow spanned the Niagara River, and the leaves wore the glorious scarlet and crimson tints of the American autumn. Sun and sky were propitious. It was the season and the day in which to see Niagara. Quarrelsome drosky drivers, incongruous mills, and the thousand trumperies of the place were all forgotten in the perfect beauty of the scene, in the full, the joyous realization of my ideas of Niagara. Beauty and terror here formed a perfect combination. Around islets covered with fair foliage of trees and vines, and carpeted with moss untrodden by the foot of man, the waters, in the wild turmoil, rage and foam, rushing on recklessly beneath the trembling bridge on which we stood to their doomed fall. This place is called the Hell of Waters, and has been the scene of more than one terrible tragedy. This bridge took us to Iris Island, so named from the rainbows which perpetually hover round its base. Everything of terrestrial beauty may be found in Iris Island. It stands amid the eternal din of the waters, a barrier between the Canadian and American falls. It is not more than sixty-two acres in extent, yet it has groves of huge forest trees, and secluded roads underneath them in the deepest shade, far apparently from the busy world, yet thousands from every part of the globe yearly tread its walks of beauty. We stopped at the top of a dizzy pathway, and leaving the walrences to purchase some curiosities, I descended it, crossing a trembling footbridge, and stood alone on Luna Island, between the Crescent and American Falls. This beauteous and richly embowered little spot, which is said to tremble, and looks as if any wave might sweep it away, has a view of matchless magnificence. From it can be seen the whole expanse of the American rapids, rolling and struggling down, chafing the sunny islets, as if jealous of their beauty. The Canadian fall was on my left, away in front stretched the scarlet woods, the incongruities of the place were out of sight, and at my feet the broad sheet of the American fall tumbled down in terrible majesty. The violence of the rapids cannot be imagined by one who has not seen their resistless force. The turbulent waters are flung upward, as if infuriated against the sky. The rocks, whose jagged points are seen among them, fling off the hurried and foamy waves, as if with supernatural strength. Nearer and nearer they come to the fall, becoming every instant more agitated. They seem to recoil as they approach its verge. A momentary calm follows, and then, like all their predecessors, they go down the abyss together. There is something very exciting in this view. One cannot help investing Niagara with feelings of human agony and apprehension. One feels a new sensation, something neither terror, wonder, nor admiration, as one looks at the phenomena which it displays. I have been surprised to see how a visit to the falls galvanizes the most matter-of-fact person into a brief exercise of the imaginative powers. As the sound of the muffled drum too often accompanies the trumpet, so the beauty of Luna Island must ever remain associated in my mind with a terrible catastrophe which recently occurred there. Niagara was at its gayest, and the summer at its hottest, when a joyous party went to spend the day on Luna Island. It consisted of a Mr. and a Mrs. De Forest, their beautiful child Nettie, a young man of great talent and promise, Mr. Addington, and a few other persons. It was a fair evening in June, when moonlight was struggling for ascendancy with the declining beams of the setting sun. The elders of the party, being tired, repaired to the seats on Iris Island to rest, Mr. De Forest calling to Nettie, "'Come here, my child, don't go near the water.' "'Never mind, let her alone, I'll watch her,' said Mr. Addington, for the child was very beautiful and a great favourite, and the youthful members of the party started for Luna Island. Nettie pulled Addington's coat in her glee. "'Ah, you rogue, you're caught,' said he, catching hold of her. "'Shall I throw you in?' She sprang forward from his arms, one step too far, and fell into the roaring rapid. "'Oh, mercy! Say, she's gone!' the young man cried, and sprang into the water. He caught hold of Nettie, and, by one or two vigorous strokes, aided by an eddy, was brought close to the island. One instant more, and his terrified companions would have been able to lay hold of him. But no, the hour of both was come. The waves of the rapid hurried them past. One piercing cry came from Mr. Addington's lips. "'For Jesus' sake! Oh, save our souls!' And locked in each other's arms, both were carried over the fatal falls." 
the dashing torrent rolled onward, unheeding that bitter despairing cry of human agony, and the bodies of these two, hurried into eternity in the bloom of youth, were not found for some days. Mrs. de Forest did not long survive the fate of her child. The guide related to me another story in which my readers may be interested, as it is one of the poetical legends of the Indians. It took place in years now long gone by, when the Indians worshipped the great spirit where they beheld such a manifestation of his power. Here, where the presence of deity made the forest ring, and the ground tremble, the Indians offered a living sacrifice once a year, to be conveyed by the water-spirit to the unknown gulf. Annually, in the month of August, the sacum gave the word, and fruits and flowers were stowed in a white canoe, to be paddled by the fairest maiden among the tribe. The tribe thought itself highly honoured when its turn came to float the blooming offering to the shrine of the great spirit, and still more honoured was the maid who was a fitting sacrifice. Oronto, the proudest chief of the Senecas, had an only child named Lena. This chief was a noted and dreaded warrior, over many a bloody fight his single eagle plume had waved, and ever in battle he left a red track of his hatchet and tomahawk. Years rolled by, and every one sent its summer offering to the thunder-god of the then unexplored Niagara. Oronto danced at many a feast which followed the sacrificial gift, which his tribe had rejoicingly given in their turn. He felt not for the fathers whose children were thus taken from their wigwams, and committed to the grave of the roaring waters. Kalma, his wife, had fallen by a foeman's arrow, and in the blood of his enemies he had terribly avenged his bereavement. Fifteen years had passed since then, and the infant which Kalma left had matured into a beautiful maiden. The day of sacrifice came. It was the year of the Senecas, and Lena was acknowledged to be the fairest maiden of the tribe. The moonlit hour has come, the rejoicing dance goes on, Oronto has, without a tear, parted from his child, to meet her in the happy hunting-grounds where the great spirit reigns. The yell of triumph rises from the assembled Indians. The white canoe, loosed by the sacums, has shot from the bank, but ere it has sped from the shore another dancing craft has gone forth upon the whirling water, and both have set out on a voyage to eternity. The first bears the offering, Lena, seated amidst fruits and flowers, the second contains Oronto, the proud chief of the Senecas. Both seem to pause on the verge of the descent, then together rise on the whirling rapids. One mingled look of apprehension and affection is exchanged, and while the woods ring with the yells of the savages, Oronto and Lena plunge into the abyss in their white canoes. This wild legend was told me by the guide in full view of the cataract, and seemed so real and lifelike that I was somewhat startled by being accosted thus, by a voice speaking in a sharp, nasal, down-east twang, "'Well, stranger, I guess that's the finest water-power you've ever set eyes on.' My thoughts were likewise recalled to the fact that it was necessary to put on an oilskin dress, and scramble down a very dilapidated staircase to the Cave of the Winds, in order to do Niagara in the regulation manner. This cave is partly behind the American Fall, and is the abode of howling winds and ceaseless eddies of spray. It is an extremely good shower-bath, but the day was rather too cold to make that luxury enjoyable. I went down another steep path, and after crossing a shaky footbridge over part of the Grand Rapids, ascended the Prospect Tower, a stone erection forty-five feet high, built on the very verge of the Horseshoe Fall. It is said that people feel involuntarily suicidal intentions while standing on the balcony round this tower. I did not experience them myself, possibly because my only companion was the half-tipsy Irish drosky driver. The view from this tower is awful, the edifice has been twice swept away, and probably no strength of masonry could permanently endure the wear of the rushing water at its base. Down come these beauteous billows, as if eager for their terrible leap. Along the ledge over which they fall, they are still for one moment in a sheet of clear, brilliant green— another, and down they fall like cataracts of driven snow, chasing each other, till, roaring and hissing, they reach the abyss, sending up a column of spray one hundred feet in height. No existing words can describe it, no painter can give the remotest idea of it. It is the voice of the great Creator, its name signifying, in the beautiful language of the Iroquois, the thunder of waters. Looking from this tower, above you see the grand rapids, one dizzying sheet of leaping, foamy billows, and below you look, if you can, into the very cauldron itself, 
and see how the bright green waves are lost in foam and mist, and behind you look to shore, and shudder to think how the frail bridge by which you came in another moment may be washed away. I felt, as I came down the trembling staircase, that one wish of my life had been gratified in seeing Niagara. Some graves were recently discovered in Iris Island, with skeletons in a sitting posture inside them, probably the remains of those aboriginal races who here in their ignorance worshipped the great spirit, within the sound of his almighty voice. We paused on the bridge, and looked once more at the islets in the rapids, and stopped on Bath Island, lovely in itself, but desecrated by the presence of a remarkably hirsute American, who keeps a toll-house, with the words ice-creams and Indian curiosities painted in large letters upon it. Again another bridge, by which we crossed to the main land, and, while overwhelmed at once by the beauty and the sublimity of the scene, all at once the idea struck me that the Yankee who called Niagara an almighty fine water privilege was tolerably correct in his definition, for the water is led off in several directions for the use of large saw and paper mills. We made several purchases at an Indian curiosity shop, where we paid for the articles about six times their value, and meanwhile our driver took the opportunity of getting some at warm, which very nearly resulted in our getting something cold, for twice, in our driving over a stump, he all but upset us into ponds. Crossing the suspension bridge we arrived at the V.R. Custom House, where a tiresome detention usually occurs, but a few words spoken in Gaelic to the Scotch officer produced a magical effect, which might have been the same had we possessed anything contraband. A drive of three miles brought us to the whirlpool. The giant cliffs, which rise to the height of nearly three hundred feet, wall in the waters and confine their impetuous rush, so that their force raises them in the middle, and hurls them up some feet into the air. Their fury is resistless, and the bodies of those who are carried over the falls are whirled around here in a horrible dance, frequently till decomposition takes place. There is nothing to excite admiration about the whirlpool. The impression which it leaves on the mind is highly unpleasing." Another disagreeable necessity was to visit a dark, deep chasm in the bank, a very gloomy spot. This demon-titled cavity has never felt the influence of a ray of light. A massive cliff rises above it, and a narrow stream, bearing the horrible name of Bloody Run, pours over this cliff into the chasm. To most minds there is a strange fascination about the terrible and mysterious, and in spite of warning looks and beseeching gestures on the part of Mr. Walrence, who feared the effect of the story on the weak nerves of his wife, I sat down by the chasm and asked the origin of the name Bloody Run. I will confess that, as I looked down into the yawning hole, imagination lent an added horror to the tale, which was bad enough in itself." In 1759, while the French, who had in their pay the Seneca Indians, hovered round the British, a large supply of provisions was forwarded from Fort Niagara to Fort Slosher by the latter, under the escort of a hundred regulars. The savage chief of the Senecas, anxious to obtain the promised reward for scalps, formed an ambuscade of chosen warriors, several hundred in number. The Devil's Hole was the spot chosen. It seemed made on purpose for the bloody project." It was a hot, sultry day in August, and the British, scattered and sauntered on their toilsome way, till, overcome by fatigue or curiosity, they sat down near the margin of the precipice. A fearful yell arose, accompanied by a volley of bullets, and the Indians, breaking from their cover, under the combined influences of ferocity and fire-water, rushed upon their unhappy victims before they had time to stand to their arms, and tomahawked them on the spot. Wagons, horses, soldiers, and drivers were then hurled over the precipice, and the little stream ran into the Niagara River a torrent purple with human gore. Only two escaped to tell the terrible tale. Some years ago, bones, arms, and broken wheels were found among the rocks, mementos of the barbarity which has given the little streamlet the terror-inspiring name of Bloody Run. After depositing our purchases at the Clifton House, where the waiter warned us to put them under lock and key, I hoped that sight-seeing was over, and that at last I should be able to gaze upon what I had really come to visit, the falls of Niagara. But no, I was to be victimized still further. I must go behind the great sheet. Mr. and Mrs. Walrence would not go, they said their heads would not stand it, but that, as an Englishwoman, go I must. 
In America the capabilities of English ladies are very much overrated. It is supposed that they go about in all weathers, invariably walk ten miles a day, and leap five-barreled fences on horseback. Yielding to the inexorable law of a stern necessity, I went to the rock house, and a very pleasing girl produced a suit of oiled calico. I took off my cloak, bonnet, and dress. Oh, she said, you must change everything. It is so very wet. As to save time, I kept demurring to taking off various articles of apparel. I always received the same reply, and finally abandoned myself to a complete change of attire. I looked in the mirror, and beheld as complete a tattered demolion as one could see begging upon an Irish highway, though there was nothing about the dress which the most lively imagination could have tortured into the picturesque. The externals of this strange equipment consisted of an oiled calico hood, a garment like a carter's frock, a pair of blue worsted stockings, and a pair of India rubber shoes much too large for me. My appearance was so comic as to excite the laughter of my grave friends, and I had to reflect that numbers of persons had gone out in the same attire before I could make up my mind to run the gauntlet of the loiterers around the door. Here a negro guide of most repulsive appearance awaited me, and I waded through a perfect sea of mud to the shaft by which people go under Table Rock. My friends were evidently ashamed of my appearance, but they met me here to wish me a safe return, and following the guide I dived down a spiral staircase, very dark and very much out of repair. Leaving this staircase, I followed the guide along a narrow path covered with fragments of shale, with Table Rock above and the deep abyss below. A cold, damp wind blew against me, succeeded by a sharp, pelting rain, and the path became more slippery and difficult. Still I was not near the sheet of water, and felt not the slightest dizziness. I speedily arrived at the difficult point of my progress. Heavy gusts almost blew me away, showers of spray nearly blinded me, I was quite deafened and half drowned, I wished to retreat, and essayed to use my voice to stop the progress of my guide. I raised it to a scream, but it was lost in the thunder of the cataract. The negro saw my incertitude and extended his hand. I shuddered even there as I took hold of it, not quite free from the juvenile idea that the black comes off. He seemed at that moment to wear the aspect of a black imp leading me to destruction. The path is a narrow, slippery ledge of rock. I am blinded with spray. The darkening sheet of water is before me. Shall I go on? The spray beats against my face, driven by the contending gusts of wind, which rush into the eyes, nostrils, and mouth, and almost prevent my progress. The narrowing ledge is not more than a foot wide, and the boiling gulf is seventy feet below. Yet thousands have pursued this way before, so why should not I? I grasp tighter hold of the guide's hand, and proceed step by step, holding down my head. The water beats against me, the path narrows, and will only hold my two feet abreast. I ask the guide to stop, but my voice is drowned by the thunder of waters. He guesses what I would say, and shrieks in my ear, It's worse going back. I make a desperate attempt, four steps more, and I am at the end of the ledge. My breath is taken away, and I can only just stand against the gusts of wind which are driving the water against me. The gulf is but a few inches from me, and gasping for breath and drenched to the skin, I become conscious that I have reached Termination Rock. Once arrived at this place, the clouds of driving spray are a little thinner, and though it is still very difficult either to see or breathe, the magnificence of the temple, which here is formed by the natural bend of the cataract and the backward shelf of the precipice, makes a lasting impression on the mind. The temple seems a fit and awful shrine for him who rides on the wings of mighty winds, and, completely shut out from man's puny works, the mind rises naturally in adoring contemplation to him whose voice is heard in the thunder of the waters. The path was so very narrow that I had to shuffle backwards for a few feet, and then, drenched, shivering, and breathless, my galoshes full of water and slipping off at every step, I fought my way through the blinding clouds of spray and climbing up the darkened staircase, again stood on table rock, with water dripping from my hair and garments. It is usual for those persons who survive the expedition to take hot brandy and water after changing their dresses, and it was probably from neglecting this precaution that I took such a severe chill as afterwards produced the og. On the whole, this achievement is pleasanter in the remembrance than in the act. 
there is nothing whatsoever to boast of in having accomplished it, and nothing to regret in leaving it undone. I knew the danger and disagreeableness of the exploit before I went, and had I known that going behind the sheet was synonymous with going to Termination Rock, I should never have gone. No person who has not a very strong head ought to go at all, and it is by every one far better omitted, as the remaining portion of Table Rock may fall at any moment, for which reason some of the most respectable guides decline to take visitors underneath it. I believe that no amateur ever thinks of going a second time. After all, the front view is the only one for Niagara. Going behind the sheet is like going behind a picture frame. After this we went to the top of a tower, where I had a very good bird's-eye view of the falls, the rapids, and the general aspect of the country, and then, refusing to be victimized by burning springs, museums, prisoned eagles, and mangy buffaloes, I left the Walrences, who were tired, to go to the hotel, and walked down to the ferry, and scrambling out to the rock farthest in the water and nearest to the cataract, I sat down, completely undisturbed in view of the mighty fall. I was not distracted by parasitic guides or sandwich-eating visitors. The vile museums, pagodas, and tea-gardens were out of sight. The sublimity of the falls far exceeded my expectations, and I appreciated them the more, perhaps, from having been disappointed with the first view. As I sat watching them, a complete oblivion of everything but the falls themselves stole over me. A person may be very learned in statistics. He may tell you that the falls are one hundred and sixty feet high, that their whole width is nearly four-fifths of a mile, that according to estimate ninety million tons of water pass over them at every hour, that they are the outlet of several bodies of water covering one hundred and fifty thousand square miles. But unless he has seen Niagara, he cannot form the faintest conception of it. It was so very like what I had expected, and yet so totally different. I sat there watching that sea-green curve against the sky till sunset, and then the crimson rays just fell upon the column of spray above the Canadian fall, turning it a most beautiful rose color. The sun set, a young moon arose, and brilliant stars shone through the light veil of mist, and in the darkness the cataract looked like drifted snow. I rose at length, perfectly unconscious that I had been watching the falls for nearly four hours, and that my clothes were saturated with the damp and mist. It would be out of place to enter upon the numerous geological speculations which have arisen upon the structure and recession of Niagara. It seems as if the faint light which science has shed upon the abyss of bygone ages were but to show that its depths must remain for ever unlighted by human reason and research. There was such an air of gloom about Clifton House that we sat in the balcony till the cold became intense, and as it was too dark to see anything but a white object in front, I could not help regretting the waste, as it seems, of this wonderful display going on, when no eyes can feast upon its sublimity. In the saloon there was a little fair-haired boy of seven years old, with the intellectual faculties largely developed, indeed so much so as to be painfully suggestive of water on the brain. His father called him in the middle of the room, and he repeated a long oration of Daniel Webster's without once halting for a word, giving to it the action and emphasis of the orator. This was a fair specimen of the frequent undue development of the minds of American children. At Niagara I finally took leave of the Walrences, as I had many visits to pay, and near midnight left for Hamilton, under the escort of a very kind, but very Grandiasonian Scotch gentleman. I was intensely tired and sleepy, and it was a very cheerless thing to leave a warm room at midnight for an omnibus drive of two miles along a bad, unlighted road. There did not appear to be any waiting-room at the bustling station at the suspension bridge, for, alas, the hollow scream of the locomotive is heard even above the thunder of Niagara. I slept in the cars for an hour before we started, and never woke till the conductor demanded payment of my fare in no very gentle tones. We reached Hamilton shortly after two in the morning, in the midst of a high wind and pouring rain, and in company with a dozen very dirty immigrants we entered a lumber-wagon with a canvas top, drawn by one miserable horse. The curtains very imperfectly kept out the rain, and we were in continual fear of an upset. At last the vehicle went down on one side, and all the Irish immigrants tumbled over each other and us, with a profusion of ox, murders, and spalpeens. 
The driver composedly shouted to us to alight. The hole was only deep enough to sink the vehicle to the axle-tree. We got out into a very capacious lake of mud, and in again, in very ill humour. At last the horse fell down in a hole, and my Scotch friend and I got out and walked in the rain for some distance to a very comfortable hotel, the City Arms. The sun had scarcely warmed the world into waking life before I was startled from my sleep by the cry, Six o'clock, all aboard for the bus at half past, them as goes by the passport and Highlander. But it was half past, and I had barely time to dress before the disagreeable shout of all aboard echoed through the house, and I hurried downstairs into an omnibus which held twenty two persons inside, commodiously seated in armchairs. I went down Lake Ontario in the Highlander. Mr. Forrest met me on the wharf, and in a few hours I was again warmly welcomed at his hospitable place. My relics of my visit to Niagara consisted of a few Indian curiosities, and a printed certificate filled up with my name, stating that I had walked for two hundred and thirty feet behind the Great Fall, which statement, I was assured by an American fellow-traveller, was a cell ride entirely, an almighty, all-fired, big flam. End of chapter 11 Read by Sibella Denton. For more information, please visit LibriVox.org. Of the English Woman in America by Isabella Lucy Bird. Read for LibriVox.org into the public domain. Chapter 12. The Arabian, by which I left Toronto, was inferior to any American steamer I had travelled in. It was crowded with both saloon and steerage passengers, bound for Cobourg, Port Hope, and Montreal. It was very bustling and dirty, and the carpet was plentifully sprinkled with tobacco juice. The captain was very much flustered with his unusually large living cargo, but he was a good-hearted man, and very careful, having, to use his own phrase, climbed in at the hoss-holes, and worked his way aft, instead of creeping in at the cabin window with his gloves on. The stewards were dirty, and the steward is too smart to attend to the comforts of the passengers. As passengers' crates and boxes poured in at both the fore and aft entrances, I went out on the little slip of deck to look at the prevalent confusion, having previously ascertained that all my effects were secure. The scene was a very amusing one, for acting out the maxim that time is money, comparatively few of the passengers came down to the wharf more than five minutes before the hour of sailing. People among whom were a number of unprotected females, and juveniles who would not move on, were entangled among trucks and carts discharging cargo, hacks, horses, crates, and barrels. These passengers, who would find it difficult to elbow their way unencumbered, find it next to impossible when their hands are burdened with uncut books, baskets of provender, and diminutive carpet-bags. Horses back carts against helpless females, barrels roll upon people's toes, newspaper hawkers puff their wares, bonbon vendors push their plaster of Paris abominations almost at people's eyes, yet, strange to say, it is very seldom that any accident occurs." Family groups invariably are separated, and distracted mamas are running after children whom everybody wishes out of the way, giving utterance to hopes that they are not on shore. Then the obedient papa is set on shore to look after that dear little Harry, who is probably all the time in the ladies' saloon on some child fancier's lap eating bonbons. The board is drawn in, the moorings are cast off, the wheels revolve, the bell rings, the engine squeals, and away speeds the steamer down the calm waters of Lake Ontario. Little children and inquisitive young ladies are knocked down or blackened in coiling the hawser, by hands who, being nothing but hands, evidently cannot say, I beg your pardon, miss. There were children, who always go where they ought not to be, running against people, and taking hold of their clothes with sticky, smeared hands, asking commercial gentlemen to spin their tops, and corpulent ladies to play at hide-and-seek. I saw one stern-visaged gentleman tormented in this way till he looked ready to give the child its final quietus. I note that American juveniles are, generally speaking, completely destitute of that agreeable shyness which prevents English and Scotch children from annoying strangers." There were angry people who had lost their portmanteaus, and were ransacking the state-rooms in quest of them, and indolent people who lay on the sofas reading novels and chewing tobacco. 
Some gentleman, taking no heed of a printed notice, goes into the lady's cabin to see if his wife is safe on board, and meets with a rebuff from the stewardess, who tells him that gentlemen are not admitted, and knowing that the sense, or, as he would say, the nonsense of the community is against him, he beats a reluctant retreat. Everybody seems to have lost somebody or something, but in an hour or two the ladies are deep in novels, the gentlemen in the morning papers, the children have quarrelled themselves to sleep, and the captain has gone to smoke by the funnel. I sat on the slip of a deck with a lady from Lake Superior, niece of the accomplished poetess Mrs. Hemans, and she tried to arouse me into admiration of the shore of Lake Ontario, but I confess that I was too much occupied with the race which we were running with the American steamer Maple Leaf, to look at the flat, gloomy, forest-fringed coast. There is an inherent love of the excitement of a race in all human beings. Even old ladies are not exempt from it, if we may believe a story which I heard on the Mississippi. An old lady was going down the river for the first time, and expressed to the captain her earnest hope that there would be no racing. Presently another boat neared them, and half the passengers urged the captain to pile on. The old lady shrieked and protested, but to no purpose. The skipper piled on, and as the race was a very long and doubtful one, she soon became excited. The rival boat shot ahead. The old lady gave a side of bacon, her sole possession, to feed the boiler fires. The boat was left behind. She clapped her hands. It ran ahead again, and frantic, she seated herself upon the safety valve. It was again doubtful, but, lo, the antagonist's boat was snagged, and the lady gave a yell of perfect delight when she saw it discomfited, and a hundred human beings struggling in the water. Our race, however, was destitute of excitement, for the maple leaf was a much better sailor than ourselves. Dinner constituted an important event in the day, and was dispatched very voraciously, though some things were raw, others overdone, and all greasy." but the three hundred people who sat down to dinner were, as some one observed, three hundred reasons against eating anything. I had to endure a severe attack of og, and about nine o'clock the stewardess gave up her room to me, and, as she faithfully promised to call me half an hour before we changed the boats, I slept very soundly. At five she came in. "'Get up, miss. We're at Guananoak. You've only five minutes to dress.' I did dress in five minutes, and leaving my watch, with some very valuable lockets under my pillow, hastened across a narrow plank, half blinded by snow, into the clean, light, handsome steamer New Era. I did not allow myself to fall asleep in the very comfortable stateroom which was provided for me by the friend with whom I was travelling, but hurried upstairs with the first grey of the chilly, wintry dawn of the morning of the 18th of October. The saloon windows were dimmed with snow, so I went out on deck and braved the driving wind and snow on that inhospitable morning, for we were in the lake of the Thousand Islands. Travellers have written and spoken so much of the beauty of this celebrated piece of water that I expected to be disappointed, but, au contraire, I am almost inclined to write a rhapsody myself. For three hours we were sailing among these beautiful, irregularly formed islands. There are 1,692 of them, and they vary in size from mere rocks to several acres in extent. Some of them are perfect paradises of beauty. They form a complete labyrinth, through which the pilot finds his way, guided by numerous beacons. Sometimes it appeared as if there were no egress, and as if we were running straight upon a rock, and the water is everywhere so deep that from the deck of the steamer people can pull the leaves from the trees." A hundred varieties of trees and shrubs grow out of the grey, lichen-covered rocks. It seems barbarous that the paddles of a steamer should disturb their delicate shadows. If I found this lake so beautiful on a day in the middle of October, when the bright autumn tints had changed into a russet brown, and when a chill north-east wind was blowing about the withered leaves, and snow against the ship, and when more than all I was only just recovering from Og, what would it be on a bright summer day, when the blue of heaven would be reflected in the clear waters of the St. Lawrence? By nine a furious snowstorm rendered all objects indistinct, and the fog had thickened to such an extent that we could not see five feet ahead, so we came to anchor for an hour. A very excellent breakfast was dispatched during this time, and at ten we steamed off again, steering by compass on a river barely a mile wide. The new era was a boat of a remarkably high draught of water. The saloon, or deck-house, came to within fifteen feet of the bow, and on the hurricane-deck above there was a tower containing a double wheel, 
with which the ship is steered by chains one hundred feet long. There is a lookout place in front of this tower, generally occupied by the pilot, a handsome, ruffian-looking French voyageur, with earrings in his ears. Captain Chrysler, whose caution, urbanity, and kindness render him deservedly popular, seldom leaves this post of observation, and personally pays a very great attention to his ship, for the river St. Lawrence is as bad a reputation for destroying vessels which navigate it as the Mississippi. The snow was now several inches deep on deck, and melting near the deck-house, trickled under the doors and into the saloon. The moisture inside, also, condensed upon the ceiling, and produced a constant shower-bath for the whole day. Sofas and carpets were alike wet. Everybody sat in galoshes, the ladies in cloaks, the gentlemen in oilskins, the smell of the latter, and of so many wet woolen clothes, in an apartment heated by stove-heat, being almost unbearable. At twelve the fog and snow cleared away, and revealed to view the mighty St. Lawrence, a rapid stream whirling along in small eddies, between slightly elevated banks, dotted with white homesteads. We passed a gigantic raft, with five log shanties upon it, near Prescott. These rafts go slowly and safely down the St. Lawrence and the Ottawa, till they come to La Chine, where frequently catastrophes happen, if one may judge from the timber which strews the rocks. A gentleman read from a newspaper these terrible statistics— horrible, if true, forty-four murders and seven hundred murderous assaults have been committed at New York within the last six months. Sensation. We stopped at Prescott, one of the oldest towns in Canada, and shortly afterwards passed the blackened ruins of a windmill, and some houses held by a band of American sympathizers during the rebellion of 1838, but from which they were dislodged by the cannon of the royal troops. Five hundred American sympathizers, with several pieces of cannon, under cover of darkness, on a lovely night in May, landed at this place. Soon after, they were attacked by a party of English regulars and militiamen, who drove them into a windmill and two strong stone houses, which they loopholed, and defended themselves with a pertinacity which one would have called heroism, had it been in a better cause. They finally surrendered, and were carried prisoners to Kingston, where six of them were hanged. Their leader, a military adventurer, a Pole of the name of von Schultz, was the first to be executed. He fought with a skill and bravery worthy of the nation from whence he sprang, and died without complaint, except of those who had enticed him to fight for a godless cause, under the name of liberty. Brighter days have since dawned upon Canada, and at this time the most discontented can scarcely find the shadow of a grievance to lay hold of. As an instance of the way in which the utilitarian essentials of a high state of civilization are diffused throughout Canada, I may mention that when we arrived at Cornwall, I was able to telegraph to Kingston for my lost watch, and received a satisfactory answer in half an hour. After sailing down this mighty river at a rapid rate for some hours, we ran the Galoose Rapids. Running the rapids is a favorite, and I must add a charming diversion of adventurous travellers. There is just that slight sense of danger which lends a zest to novelty, and it is furnished by the facts that some timid persons land before coming to the rapids, and that many vessels have come to an untimely end in descending them. There is a favorite story of General Amherst, who during the war was sent down by the river to attack Montreal, with three hundred and fifty men, and the first intimation which the inhabitants received of the intended surprise was through the bodies of the ill-fated detachment, clothed in the well-known scarlet, floating by their city, the victims of the ignorance or treachery of the pilot. One of the great pleasures which I promised myself in my visit to Canada was from running these rapids, and I was not disappointed. At the Galoose the river expands into a wide, shallow stream, containing beautiful islands, among which the water rushes furiously, being broken into large waves, boiling, foaming, and whirling around. The steamer neared the rapids, half her steam was shut off, Six men appeared at the wheel. We glided noiselessly along in smooth, green, deep water. The furious waves were before us. The steamer gave one perceptible downward plunge. The spray dashed over the bows, and at a speed of twenty-five miles an hour we hurried down the turbulent hill of waters, running so near the islands, often that escape seemed hopeless, then guided safely away by the skill of the pilot. The next rapid was the Long Salt, above a mile in length. The St. Lawrence is here divided into two channels. The one we took is called the Lost Passage. The Indian pilot who knew it died, and it has been recovered only within the last five years. It is a very fine rapid, the islands being extremely picturesque. 
we went down it at a dizzy speed, with all our steam on. I suppose that soon after this we entered the lower provinces, for the aspect of things totally changed. The villages bore French names, there were high wooden crosses by the waterside, the houses were many gabled and many windowed, with tiers of balconies, and the setting sun flashed upon Romish churches with spires of glittering tin. Everything was marked by stagnation and retrogression, the people are habitants, and the clergy curés. We ran the Cedars, a magnificent rapid, superior in beauty to the grand rapids at Niagara, and afterwards those of the Coteau du Lac and the Split Rock but were obliged to anchor at La Chine, as its celebrated cataract can only be shot by daylight. It was cold and dark, and nearly all the passengers left La Chine by the cars for Montreal, to avoid what some people consider the perilous descent of this rapid. As both means of reaching Montreal were probably equally safe, I decided on remaining on board, having secured a stateroom. My companions in the saloon were the captain's wife and a lady who seemed decidedly flighty, and totally occupied in waiting upon a poodle lap-dog. After the captain left, the stokers and pokers, and stewards and cooks, extemporized a ball, with the assistance of a blind Scotch fiddler, and invited numerous lassies, who appeared as if by magic from a wharf to which we were moored. I cannot say how they tripped it on the light fantastic toe, for brogues and hilos stumped heavily on the floor but what was wanting in elegance was amply compensated for by merriment and vivacity. The conversation was rather of a polyglot character, being carried on in French, Gaelic, and English. Throughout the night I was occupied in incessant attempts to keep up vital warmth, and when the steward called me at five o'clock, I found that I had been sleeping with the window open, and that the water in the jug was frozen. Wintry-looking stars were twinkling through a frosty fog. The wet housers were frozen stiff on deck, Six came, the hour of starting, but still there were no signs of moving. Railroads have not yet taught punctuality to the Canadians, but better things are in store for them. Cold to the very bone, I walked up and down the saloon to warm myself. The floor was wet, covered in saturated rugs, there were no fires in the stoves, and my only resource was to lean against the engine enclosure, and warm my frozen hands on the hot wood. I was joined by a very old gentleman, who, amid many complaints, informed me that he had an attack of apoplexy during the night, and some one, finding him insensible, had opened the jugular vein. His lank white hair flowed over his shoulders, and his neckcloth and shirt-front were smeared with blood. He said he had cut his wife's throat, and that her ghost was after him. "'There, there!' he said, pointing to a corner. I looked at his eyes, and saw at once that I was in the company of a madman." He then said that he was the king of the island of Montreal, and that he had murdered his wife because she was going to betray him to the Queen of England. He was now, he declared, going down to make a public entrance into Montreal. After this avowal I treated him with the respect due to his fancied rank, till I could call the stewards without exciting his suspicions. They said that he was a confirmed lunatic, and that he had several times attempted to lay violent hands upon himself. They thought that he must have escaped from his keeper at Brockville, and, with true madman's cunning, had secreted himself in the steamer. They kept him under strict surveillance till we arrived at Montreal, and frustrated an attempt which he made to throw himself into the rapid, as we were descending it. At seven we unmoored from the pier at La Chine, and steamed over the calm waters of the Lac Saint-Louis, under the care of a Canadian voyageur, who acted as a subordinate to an Indian pilot, who is said to be the only person acquainted with the passage, and whom the boats are obliged, under penalty, to take. The lake narrows at La Chine, and becomes again the St. Lawrence, which presents a most extraordinary appearance, being a hill of shallow, rushing water about a mile wide, chafing a few islands which look ready to be carried away by it. The large river Ottawa joins the St. Lawrence a short distance from this, and mingles its turbid waters with that mighty flood. The river becomes more and more rapid till we entered what might be termed a sea of large, cross, leaping waves, and raging waters enough to engulf a small boat. The idea of descending it in a steamer was an extraordinary one. It is said that from the shore a vessel looks as if it were hurrying to certain destruction. Still we hurry on, with eight men at the wheel. Rocks appear like snags in the middle of the stream. We dash straight down upon rocky islets, strewn with the wrecks of rafts, but a turn of the wheel, and we rush by them in safety at a speed, tis said, of thirty miles an hour, till a ragged ledge of rock stretches across the whirling stream. Still on we go, louder roars the flood, steeper appears the descent, 
earth, sky, and water seemed mingled together. I involuntarily took hold of the rail. The madman attempted to jump over. The flighty lady screamed and embraced more closely her poodle-dog. We reached the ledge. One narrow space free from rocks appeared. Down, with a plunge, went the bow into a turmoil of foam, and we had shot the cataract of La Chine. The exploit is one of the most agreeable which the traveller can perform, and the thick morning mist added to the apparent danger. We steamed for four or five miles farther down the river, when suddenly the great curtain of mist was rolled up as by an invisible hand, and the scene which it revealed was Montreal. I never saw a city which looked so magnificent from the water. It covers a very large extent of ground, which gently slopes upwards from the lake-like river, and is backed by the mountain, a precipitous hill, seven hundred feet in height. It is decidedly foreign in appearance, even from a distance. When the fog cleared away it revealed this mountain, with the forest which covers it, all scarlet and purple. The blue waters of the river hurried joyously along. The green and belle-isle mountains were the rosy tints of dawn, the distances were bathed in a purple glow, and the tin roofs, lofty spires, and cupolas of Montreal flashed back the beams of the rising sun. A lofty Gothic edifice, something from a distance like Westminster Abbey, and a handsome public building, with a superb wharf a mile long, of hewn stone, present a very imposing appearance from the water. We landed from the first lock of a ship canal, and I immediately drove to the residence of the Bishop of Montreal, a house near the mountain, in a very elevated situation, and commanding a magnificent view. From the bishop and his family I received the greatest kindness, and have very agreeable recollections of Montreal. It was a most curious and startling change from the wooden erections, wide streets, and the impress of novelty which pervaded everything I had seen in the new world, to the old stone edifices, lofty houses, narrow streets, and tin roofs of the city of Montreal. There are iron window-shutters, convents with grated windows and long dead walls. There are narrow thoroughfares, crowded with strangely dressed habitants, and long processions of priests. Then the French origin of the town contrasts everywhere with the English occupation of it. There are streets, the Rue saint jean the Rue Saint-Antoine, and the Rue saint françois Xavier. There are ancient customs and feudal privileges, Jesuit seminaries, and convents of the Sourgris and the Supposions, priests in long black dresses, native carters in coats with hoods, woolen nightcaps and coloured sashes, and barristers pleading in the French language. Then there are Manchester goods, in stores kept by bustling Yankees, soldiers lounge about in the scarlet and rifle uniforms of England, Presbyterian tunes sound from plain bald churches, the institutions are drawn alike from Paris and Westminster, and the public vehicles partake of the fashions of Lisbon and Longacre. You hear Plasso's Dom on one side of the street, and Galang on the other, and the United States have contributed their hotel system and their slang. Montreal is an extraordinary place. It is alive with business and enterprising traders, with soldiers, carters, and equipages. Through the kindness of the bishop I saw everything of any interest in the town. The first thing which attracted my attention was the magnificent view from the windows of the sea-house, over the wide St. Lawrence and the green mountains of Vermont. The next, an immense pair of elaborately worked bronze gates, at a villa opposite, large enough for a royal residence. The sidewalks in the outskirts of the town were still of the villainous wood, but in the streets they were very substantial, and, like the massive stone houses, looked as if they had lasted for two hundred years, and might last for a thousand more. We visited, among other things, some schools— one, the normal school, an extremely interesting place, where it is intended to train teachers on Church of England principles. I was very much surprised and pleased with the amount of solid information and high attainments of the children, as evidenced by their composition and answers to the Bishop of Montreal's very difficult questions. They looked sallow and emaciated, and contrary to what I have observed in England, the girls seemed the most intelligent. The Bishop has also established a library— where, for the small sum of four shillings a year, people can regale themselves upon a variety of works, from the volumes of Allison, not more ponderous in appearance than matter, to the newspaper literature of the day. The furrier shops are by no means to be overlooked. There were sleigh robes of buffalo, bear, fox, wolf, and raccoon, varying in price from six to thirty guineas, and coats, leggings, gloves, and caps, 
rendered necessary by the severity of a winter, in which the thermometer often stands at thirty degrees below zero. People vie with each other in the costliness of their furs and sleigh equipments, a complete set sometimes costing as much as a hundred guineas. I went into the Romish Cathedral, which is the largest Gothic building in the New World. It was intended to be very imposing, it has succeeded in being very extravagant, and if the architects intended that their work should live in the admiration of succeeding generations, like Yorkminster, Colonia, or Rouen, they have signally failed. Internally, the effect of its vast size is totally destroyed by pews and galleries which accommodate ten thousand people. There are some very large and very hideous paintings in it, in a very inferior style of sign-painting. The ceiling is painted bright blue, and the high altar was one mass of gaudy tinsel decorations. In one corner there was a picture of babies being devoured by pigs, and trampled upon by horses, and underneath it was a box for offerings, with, This is the fate of the children of China, upon it. By it was a wooden box, hung with faded pink calico, containing small wooden representations, in the Noah's Ark style, of dogs, horses, and pigs, and a tall man holding up a little dog by its hind leg. This peep-show, for I can call it nothing else, was at the same time so inexplicable and so ludicrous, that to avoid shocking the feelings of a devout-looking woman who was praying near it by an éclat du rire, we hurried from the church. I met with many sincere and devout Romanists among the upper classes in Canada. I know that there are thousands among the simple habitants, and, though in a thoughtless moment, the fooleries and puerilities of their churches may excite a smile, it is a matter for the deepest regret that so many of our fellow-subjects should be the dupes of a despotic priesthood, and of a religion which cannot save. Close to the cathedral is the convent of the Grey Sisters, who, with the most untiring zeal and kindness, fulfil the vocations of the Sisters of Charity. There are several other convents, some of them very strict, and their high walls and grated windows give Montreal a very continental appearance. On a lady remarking to a sister in one of these, that the view from the windows was very beautiful, she replied, with a suppressed sigh, that she had never seen it. There are some very fine public buildings and banks, but as I am not writing a guide-book, I will not dilate upon their merits. We walked around Le Champ de Mars, formerly the great resort of the Montreal young ladies, and along the Rue Notre-Dame, to the market-place, which is said to be the second finest in the world, and with its handsome façade and bright tin dome, forms one of the most prominent objects from the water. As these disgusting disfigurements of our English towns, butchers' shops, are not to be seen in the Canadian towns, nor, I believe I may say, in those in the States, there is an enormous display of meat in the Montreal market, of an appearance by no means tempting. The scene outside was extremely picturesque, there were hundreds of carts, with shaggy, patient little horses in rows, with very miscellaneous tents, cabbages and butter, jostling pork and hides. You may see here hundreds of habitants, who look as if they ought to have lived a century ago, shaggy men in fur caps and loose blue frieze-coats with hoods, and with bright sashes of coloured wool round their waists, women also, with hard features and bronzed complexions, in large straw hats, high white caps, and noisy sabots. On all sides a jargon of Irish, English, and French is to be heard, the latter generally the broadest patois. We went into the council chamber, the richly cushioned seats of which looked more fitted for sleep than deliberation, and I caught a glimpse of the ex-mayor, whose timidity during a time of popular ferment occasioned a great loss of human life. That popular Italian orator, Father Gavazzi, was engaged in denouncing the suppositions and impositions of Rome, and, on a mob evincing symptoms of turbulence, this mayor gave the order to fire to the troops who were drawn up in the streets. Scarcely had the words passed his lips, when by one volley seventeen peaceful citizens, if I recollect rightly, coming out of the Unitarian chapel, were laid low. Montreal is a turbulent place. It is not very many years since a mob assembled and burned down the Parliament House, for which exercise of the popular will the city is disqualified from being the seat of government. I saw something of Montreal society, which seemed to me to be quite on a par with that in our English provincial towns. I left this ancient city at seven o'clock on a very dark, foggy evening for Quebec, the boats between the two cities running by night, in order that the merchants, by a happy combination of travelling with sleep, may not lose that time which is to them money. 
This mode of proceeding is very annoying to tourists, who thereby lose the far-famed beauties of the St. Lawrence. It is very obnoxious likewise to timid travellers, of whom there are a large number, both male and female, for collisions and strikings on rocks or shoals are accidents of such frequent occurrence that, out of eight steamers which began the season, two only concluded it, two being disabled during my visit to Quebec. Scarcely had we left the wharf at Montreal when we came into collision with a brig, and hooked her anchor into our woodwork, which event caused a chorus of screams from some ladies whose voices were rather stronger than their nerves, and its remedy a great deal of bad language in French, German, and English, from the crews of both vessels. After this we ran down to Quebec at the rate of seventeen miles an hour, and the contretemps did not prevent even those who had screamed the loudest from partaking of a most substantial supper, which was served at eight o'clock in the lowest story of the ship. The John Munn was a very fine boat, not at all the worse for having sunk in the river in the summer. I considered Quebec quite the goal of my journey, for books, tongues, and poetry alike celebrate its beauty. Indeed, there seems to be only one opinion about it, from the lavish praise bestowed upon it by the eloquent and gifted author of Hakalaga, down to the homely accompaniments pronounced by bluff sea-captains, there seems to be a unanimity of admiration which is rarely met with. Even commercial travellers, absorbed in intricate calculations of dollars and cents, have been known to look up from their books to give it an enthusiastic expression of approval. I expected to be more pleased with it than with anything I had seen or was to see, and was insensate enough to rise at five o'clock and proceed into the saloon, when of course it was too dark for another hour to see anything. Daylight came, and from my corner by the fire I asked the stewardess when we should be in Quebec. She replied that we were close to it. I went to the window, expecting that a vision of beauty would burst upon my eyes. All that I saw might be summed up in a very few words— a few sticks placed vertically, which might be masts, and some tin spires looming through a very yellow, opaque medium. This was my first view of Quebec. Happily, on my last, the elements did full justice to its beauty. Other objects developed themselves as we steamed down to the wharf. There were huge rafts, sometimes three or four acres in extent, which, having survived the perils which had beset them on their journey from the forests of Ottawa, were now moored along the base of the lofty cliffs which, under the name of the Heights of Abraham, have a world-wide celebrity. There were huge, square-sided, bluff-bowed, low-masted ships, lying at anchor in interminable lines, and little, dirty, vicious-looking steam-tugs twirling in and out among them, and there were grim-looking muzzles of guns protruding through embrasures, and peripatetic fur caps and bayonets behind parapets of very solid masonry. Above all, shadowing all and sleeping all, was the thickest fog ever seen beyond the sound of bow-bells. It lay, thick and heavy, on Point Diamond, dimming the lustre of the bayonets of the sentinels as they paced the lofty bastions, and looked down into the abyss of fog below. It lay yet heavier on the rapid St. Lawrence, and dripped from the spars and rigging of ships. It hung over and enveloped the town, where, combined with smoke, it formed a yellow canopy, and damp and chill it penetrated the flag of England, weighing it down in heavy folds as though ominous of impending calamity. Slowly winding our torturous way among multitudinous ships, all vamped in drizzling mist, we were warped to the wharf, which was covered with a mixture of mud and coal-dust, permeated by the universal fog. Here vehicles of a most extraordinary nature awaited us, and to my great surprise they were all open— they were called calashes, and looked something like very high gigs with hoods and sea-springs. Where the dashboard was not, there was a little seat or perch for the driver, who, with a foot on each shaft, looked in a very precarious position. These conveyances have the most absurd appearance. There are, however, a few closed vehicles, both at Montreal and Quebec, which I believe are not to be found in the civilized world elsewhere, except in a few back streets of Lisbon. These consist of a square box on two wheels. This box has a top, back, and front, but where the sides ought to be there are curtains of deer-hide, which are a very imperfect protection from wind and rain. The driver sits on the roof, and the conveyance has a constant tendency backwards, which is only partly counteracted by a band under the horse's body, but only partially, and the inexperienced denizen of the box fancies himself in a state of constant jeopardy. In an open calash I drove to Russell's Hotel, along streets steeper, narrower, and dirtier than any I had ever seen. 
arrived within two hundred yards of the hotel, we were set down in the mud. On alighting, a gentleman who had been my fellow traveller politely offered to guide me, and soon after addressed me by my name. "'Who can you possibly be?' I asked, so completely had a beard metamorphosized an acquaintance of five years' standing. Once within the hotel, I had the greatest difficulty in finding my way about. It is composed of three of the oldest houses in Quebec, and has no end of long passages, dark winding staircases, and queer little rooms. It is haunted to a fearful extent by rats, and direful stories, horrible, if true, were related in the parlour of personal mutilation sustained by visitors. My room was by no means in the oldest part of the house, yet I used to hear nightly stories made in a very systematic manner by these quadruped intruders. The waiters at Russell's are complained of for their incivility, but we thought them most profuse both in their civility and attentions. Nevertheless, with all its disagreeables, Russell's is the best hotel in Quebec, and as a number of the members of the Legislative Assembly live there while Parliament meets in that city, it is very lively and amusing. When my English friends, Mr. and Mrs. Alderson, arrived, we saw a good deal of the town, but it has been so often described that I may as well pass on to other subjects. The glowing descriptions given of it by the author of Hakalaga must be familiar to many of my readers. They leave nothing to be desired, except the genial glow of enthusiasm and kindliness of heart, which threw a couleur de rose over everything he saw. There are some notions which must be unlearned in Canada, or temporarily laid aside. At the beginning of winter, which is the gay season in this Paris of the New World, every unmarried gentleman, who chooses to do so, selects a young lady to be his companion in the numerous amusements of the time. It does not seem that anything more is needed than the consent of the maiden, who, when she acquiesces in the arrangement, is called a muffin, for the mammas were muffins themselves in their day, and cannot refuse their daughters the same privilege. The gentleman is privileged to take the young lady about in his sleigh, to ride with her, to walk with her, to dance with her a whole evening without any remark, to escort her to parties, and be her attendant on all occasions. When the spring arrives, the arrangement is at an end, and I did not hear that an engagement is frequently the result, or that the same couple enter into this agreement for two successive winters. Probably the reason may be that they see too much of each other. This practice is almost universal at Montreal and Quebec. On the fine, frosty, moonlight nights, when the sleigh-bells ring merrily and the crisp snow crackles under the horses' feet, the gentlemen call to take their muffins to meetings of the sleighing clubs, or to snowshoe picnics, or to champagne suppers on the ice, from which they do not return till two in the morning. Yet, with all this apparent freedom of manner, the Canadian ladies are perfectly modest, feminine, and ladylike. Their simplicity of manners is great, and probably there is no country in the world where there is a larger amount of domestic felicity. The beauty of the young ladies of Canada is celebrated, and though on going to a large party one may not see more than two or three who are strikingly, or regularly, beautiful, the tout ensemble is most attractive. The eyes are invariably large and lustrous, dark and pensive, or blue and sparkling with vivacity. Their manners and movements are unaffected and elegant. They dress in exquisite taste, and with a grace peculiarly their own. Their manners have a fascination and witchery which is perfectly irresistible. They generally receive their education at the convents, and go into society at a very early age, very frequently before they have seen sixteen summers, and after this time the whirl of amusement precludes them from giving much time to literary employments. They are by no means deeply read, and few of them play anything more than moderate dance music. They dance beautifully, and so great is their passion for this amusement, probably derived from their French ancestors, that married ladies frequently attend the same dancing classes with their children, in order to keep themselves in a constant practice. At the time of my visit to Quebec there were large parties every night, most of which were honoured with the presence of Lord Elgin and his suite. One of his aides-de-camp was Lord Bury, Lord Abelmar's son, who, on a tour through North America, became enamoured of Quebec. Lord Elgin's secretary was Mr. Oliphant, the talented author of The Russian Shores of the Black Sea, who had also yielded to the fascinations of this northern capital. And no wonder, for there is not a friendlier place in the whole world. I went armed with but two letters of introduction, and received hospitality and kindness for which I can never be sufficiently grateful. The cholera, which in America assumes nearly the fatality and rapidity of the plague, had during the summer ravaged Quebec. It had entered and desolated happy homes, and not confining itself to the abodes of the poor and miserable, had attacked the rich, the gifted, and the beautiful. 
For long the destroying angel hovered over the devoted city, neither age nor infancy was spared, and numbers were daily hurried from the vigor of living manhood into silence and oblivion of the grave. Vigorous people, walking along the streets, were suddenly seized with shiverings and cramp, and sank down on the pavement to rise no more, sometimes actually expiring on the cold hard stones. Pleasure was forgotten, business was partially suspended, all who could fled. The gloom upon the souls of the inhabitants was heavier than the brown cloud which was supposed to brood over the city, and the steamers, which conveyed those who fled from the terrible pestilence, arrived at Toronto, freighted with the living and the dead. Among the terror-stricken, the dying and the dead, the ministers of religion pursued their holy calling, undaunted by the terrible sights which met them everywhere. The clergy of the different denominations vied with each other in their kindness and devotedness. The priests of Rome then gained a double influence. Armed with what appeared, in the eyes of the people, supernatural powers, they knew no rest either by night or day. They held a cross before many a darkening eye, and spoke to the bereaved, in the plenitude of their anguish, of a world where sorrow and separation are alike unknown. The heavy clang of tolling bells was hourly heard, as the pestilence-stricken were carried to their last homes. Medical skill availed nothing. The pestilence with walketh in darkness was only removed by him in whose hand are the issues of life and death. Quebec had been free from disease for about six weeks before I visited it. The victims of the pestilence were cold in their untimely graves. The sun of prosperity smiled upon the fortress city, and its light-hearted inhabitants had just begun their nightly round of pleasure and gaiety. The vice-royalty of Lord Elgin was drawing rapidly to a close, and two parties, given every week at Government House, afforded an example which the good people of Quebec were not slow to follow. There were more musical parties, conversaciones, and picnics to Chaudière and Lorette, and people who were dancing till four or five in the morning were vigorous enough after ten for a gallop to Montmorency. The absolute restlessness of the city astonished me very much. The morning seemed to begin, with fashionable people, with a desultory breakfast at nine o'clock, after which some received callers, others paid visits, or walked into the town to make trifling purchases at the stores, while not a few of the young ladies promenaded St. Louis Street or the Ramparts, where they were generally joined by the officers. Several officers said to me that no quarters in the world were so delightful as those at Quebec. A scarlet coat finds great favour with the fair sex at Quebec. Civilians, however great their mental qualifications, are decidedly in the background, and I was amused to see young ensigns, with budding moustaches, who had just joined their regiments, preferred before men of high literary attainments. With balls, and moose-hunting, and sleigh-driving, and tarbogganing, and last but not least, muffins, the time passes rapidly by to them. A gentleman, who had just arrived from England, declared that Quebec was a horrid place, not fit to live in. A few days after he met the same individual to whom he had made this uncomplimentary observation, and confided to him that he thought Quebec the most delightful place in the whole world, for, do you know, he said, I have got a muffin. With the afternoon numerous riding parties are formed, for you cannot go three miles out of Quebec without coming to something beautiful, and calls of a more formal nature are paid. Military band performs on Durham Terrace or the Garden, which then assume the appearance of most fashionable promenades. The evening is spent in the ballroom, or at small social dancing parties, or during the winter, before ten at night, in the galleries of the House of Assembly, and the morning is well advanced before the world of Quebec is hushed in sleep. Society is contained in very small limits at Quebec. Its elite are grouped round the ramparts and in the suburb of St. Louis. The city until recently has occupied a very isolated position, and has depended upon itself for society. It is therefore sociable, friendly, and hospitable, and though there is gossip, for where is it not to be found, I never knew any in which there was so little of ill-nature. The little world in the upper part of the city is probably the most brilliant to be found anywhere in so small a compass. But there is a world below, another nation, seldom mentioned in the aristocratic quarter of St. Louis, where vice, crime, poverty, and misery jostle each other, as pleasure and politics do in the upper town. This is the suburb of St. Roch, in whose tall dark houses and fetid alleys those are to be found whose birthright is toil, who spend life in supplying the necessities of to-day, while indulging in gloomy apprehensions for to-morrow, who have not one comfort in the past to cling to, or one hope for the future to cheer. St. Roch is as crowded as the upper town, but with a very different population, the poor, degraded, and the vicious. Here fever destroys its tens, and cholera its hundreds. Here people stab each other, and think little of it. 
Here are narrow alleys, with high, black-looking stone houses, with broken windows pasted over with paper in the lower stories, and stuffed with rags in the upper. Gradations of wretchedness which I have observed in the Cowgate and Westport at Edinburgh. Here are shoeless women, who quiet their children with ardent spirits, and brutal men, who would kill both wives and children if they dared. Here are dust-heaps in which pigs with long snouts are ever routing. Here are lean curs, wrangling with each other for leaner bones. Here are ditches and puddles, and heaps of oyster-shells, and broken crockery, and cabbage-stalks, and fragments of hats and shoes. Here are torn notices on the walls offering rewards for the apprehension of thieves and murderers, painfully suggestive of dark deeds. A little further are lumber-yards and wharves, and mud and sawdust, and dealers in old nails and rags and bones, and rotten posts and rails, and attempts at grass. Here are old barrel-hoops, and patches of old sails, and dead bushes and dead dogs, and old saucepans, and little plots of ground where cabbages and pumpkins drag on a pining existence. And then there is the River Charles, no longer clear and bright, as when trees and hills and flowers were mirrored on its surface, but foul, turbid, and polluted, with shipyards and steam engines and cranes and windlasses on its margin, and here Quebec ends. From the rich, the fashionable, and the pleasure-seeking suburb of St. Louis, few venture down into the quarter of St. Rock, save those who, at the risk of drawing in pestilence with every breath, mindful of their duty to God and man, enter those hideous dwellings, ministering to minds and bodies alike diseased. My first visit to St. Rock was on a Sunday afternoon. I had attended our own simple and beautiful service in the morning, and had seen the celebration of Vespers in the Romish Cathedral in the afternoon. Each church was thronged with well-dressed persons. It was a glorious day. The fashionable promenades were all crowded, gay uniforms and brilliant parasols thronged the ramparts, horsemen were cantering along St. Louis Street, priestly processions passed to and from the different churches, numbers of calashes containing pleasure parties were dashing about, picnic parties were returning from Montmorency and Lake Charles, groups of vivacious talkers, speaking in the language of France, were at every street corner, Quebec had all the appearance, so painful to an English or Scottish eye, of a continental Sabbath. Mr. and Mrs. Alderson and myself left this gay scene, and the constant toll of Romish bells, for St. Rock. They had lived peacefully in a rural part of Devonshire, and more recently in one of the prettiest and most thriving of the American cities, and when they first breathed the polluted air, they were desirous to return from what promised to be so peculiarly unpleasant, but kindly yielded to my desire to see something of the shady, as well as the sunny side of Quebec. No Sabbath day, with its hallowed accompaniment, seemed to have dawned upon the inhabitants of St. Rock. We saw women with tangled hair standing in the streets, and men with pallid countenances and bloodshot eyes were reeling about, or sitting with their heads resting on their hands, looking out from windows stuffed with rags. There were children, too, children in nothing but the name and stature, infancy without innocence, learning to take God's name in vain with its first lisping accents, preparing for a maturity of suffering and shame. I looked at these hideous houses, and hideous men and women, too, and at their still more repulsive progeny, with sallow faces, dwarfed forms, and countenances precocious in the intelligence of villainy, and contrasted them with the blue-eyed, rosy-cheeked infants of my English home, who chase butterflies and weave May garlands, and gather cowslips and buttercups, or the sallow children of a highland shanty, who devour instruction in mud-floored huts, and con their tasks on the heathery sides of hills." Yet when you breathe the poisoned air, laden with everything noxious to health, and have the physical and moral senses alike met with everything that can disgust and offend, it ceases to be a matter of wonder that the fair, tender plant of beautiful childhood refuses to grow in such a vitiated atmosphere. Here all distinctions between good and evil are speedily lost, if they were ever known, and men, women, and children become unnatural in vice, in irreligion, in manners and appearance. Such spots as these act like cankers, yearly spreading further and further their vitiating influences, preparing for all those fearful retributions in the shape of fever and pestilence which continually come down. Yet, lamentable as the state of such a population is, considered merely with regard to this world, it becomes fearful when we recollect that the wheels of time are ceaselessly rolling on, bearing how few, alas, to heaven, what myriads to hell, and that when this trembling consciousness of being, which clings enamoured to its anguish, not because life is sweet, but because death is bitter, is over, there remains, for those who have known nothing on earth but misery and vice, a fearful-looking thing for judgment and fiery indignation, 
when they that have done evil shall rise to the resurrection of damnation. It was not that the miserable, degraded appearance of St. Rock was anything new to me. Unfortunately, the same state of things exists in a far greater degree in our large towns at home. What did surprise me was, to find it in the new world, and that such a gigantic evil should have required only two hundred years for its growth. It seemed to me also that Quebec, the gulf which separates the two worlds, is greater even than that which lies between Belgravia and Bethnal Green, or St. Giles's. The people who live in the lower town are principally employed on the wharves, and in the lumber trade. But my readers will not thank me for detaining them in a pestiferous atmosphere, among such unpleasing scenes. We will therefore ascend to the high street of the city, resplendent with gorgeous mercer's stores, and articles of luxury of every description. This street and several others were at this period impassable for carriages, the roadways being tunnelled and heaped and barricaded, which curious and disagreeable state of things was stated to rise from the laying down of water-pipes. At night, when fires were lighted in the narrow streets, and groups of roughly dressed Frenchmen were standing round them, Quebec presented the appearance of the Faubourg Saint-Antoine after a revolution. Quebec is a most picturesque city, externally and internally. From the citadel, which stands on a rock more than three hundred feet high, down to the crowded waterside, bustling with merchants, porters, and lumbermen, all is novel and original. Massive fortifications, with guns grinning from the embrasures, form a very prominent feature. A broad glacis looks peaceful in its greenness, ramparts line the plains of Abraham, guards and sentries appear in all directions, nightfall brings with it the challenge, who goes there, and narrow gateways form inconvenient entrances to streets so steep that I wondered how mortal horses could ever toil up them. The streets are ever thronged with vehicles, particularly with rude carts drawn by rough horses, driven by French peasants, who move stolidly along, indifferent to the continual cry of Place aux Dames. The stores generally have French designations above them, the shopmen often speak very imperfect English, the names of the streets are French, Romish churches and convents abound, and sisters of charity, unwearied in their benevolence, are to be seen visiting the afflicted. Notices and cautions are posted up both in French and English. The light, vivacious tones of the French Canadians are everywhere heard, and from the pillar sacred to the memory of Wolfe upon the plains of Abraham, down to the red-coated sentry who challenges you upon the ramparts, everything tells of a conquered province, and of the time, not so very far distant either, when the lilies of France occupied the place from which the flag of England now so proudly waves. I spent a few days at Russell's Hotel, which was very full, in spite of the rats. In Canadian hotels people are very sociable, and as many, during the season, make Russell's their abode, the conversation was tolerably general at dinner. Many of the members of Parliament lived there, and they used to tell very racy and amusing stories against each other. I heard one which was considered a proof of the truth of the saying that the tailor makes the gentleman. A gentleman called on a Mr. M., who had been appointed to a place in the government, and in due time he went to return the visit. Meeting an Irishman in the street, he asked, "'Where does Mr. Smith live? It's no use your going there. I want to know where he lives, do you know? Faith, I do, but it's no use your going there.' Mr. M., now getting angry, said, "'I didn't ask you for your advice. I simply want to know where Mr. Smith lives.' "'Well, Spalpeen, he lives down at that court. But I tell you it's no use your going there, for I've just been there myself, and he's got a man. It is said that the discomfited senator returned home and bought a new hat. Passing out by the citadel, the plains of Abraham, now a race-course, are entered upon, the battlefield being denoted by a simple monument bearing the inscription, Here died Wolfe victorious. Beyond this, three miles from the city, is Spencerwood, the residence of the governor-general. It is beautifully situated, though the house is not spacious, and is rather old-fashioned. The ballroom, however, built by Lord Elgin, is a beautiful room, very large, admirably proportioned, and chastely decorated. Here a kind of vice-regal court is held, and during the latter months of Lord Elgin's tenure of office, Spencer Wood was the scene of a continued round of gaiety and hospitality. Lord Elgin was considered extremely popular. The Reciprocity Treaty, supposed to confer great benefits on the country, was passed during his administration, and the resources of Canada were prodigiously developed, and its revenue greatly increased. Of his popularity at Quebec there could be no question. He was attached to the Canadians, with whom he mixed with the greatest kindness and affability. Far from his presence being considered a restraint at an evening party, the entrance of the Governor and his suite was always the signal for increased animation and liveliness. 
The stiffness, which was said to pervade in former times the parties at Spencer Wood, was entirely removed by him, and in addition to large balls and dinner parties at the time I was in Quebec, he gave evening parties to eighty or a hundred persons twice a week, when the greatest sociability prevailed. And in addition to dancing, which was kept up on those occasions till two or three in the morning, games such as French Blindman's Bluff were introduced, to the great delight of both old and young. The pleasure with which this innovation was received by the lively and mirth-loving Canadians showed the difference in character between themselves and the American ladies. I was afterwards at a party in New York, where a gentleman who had been at Spencer Wood attempted to introduce one of these games, but it was received with gravity, and proved a signal failure. Lord Elgin certainly attained that end which is too frequently lost sight of in society, making people enjoy themselves. Personally, I may speak with much gratitude of his kindness during the short but very severe illness with which I was attacked while at Spencer Wood. Glittering epaulettes, scarlet uniforms, and muslin dresses whirled before my dizzy eyes. I lost for a moment the power to articulate. A deathly chill came over me. I shivered, staggered, and would have fallen had I not been supported. I was carried upstairs, feeling sure that the terrible pestilence which I had so carefully avoided had at length seized me. The medical man arrived at two in the morning, and ordered the remedies which were usually employed at Quebec a complete envelope of mustard plasters, a profusion of blankets, and as much ice as I could possibly eat. The physician told me that cholera had again appeared in St. Rock, where I, strangely enough, had been on two successive afternoons. So great was the panic caused by the cholera, that wherever it was necessary to account for my disappearance, Lord Elgin did so, by saying that I was attacked with Og. The means used were blessed by a kind providence to the removal of the malady, and in two or three days I was able to go about again, though I suffered severely for several subsequent weeks. From Spencer Wood I went to the house of the Honourable John Ross, from whom and from Mrs. Ross I received the greatest kindness, kindness which should make my recollections of Quebec lastingly agreeable. Mr. Ross's public situation as President of the Legislative Council gave me an opportunity of seeing many persons, whose acquaintance I should not have made under other circumstances and as parties were given every evening but one while I was at Quebec, to which I was invited with my hosts, I saw as much of its society as, under ordinary circumstances, I should have seen in a year. No position is pleasanter than that of an English stranger in Canada, with good introductions. I received much kindness from Dr. Mountain, the venerable Protestant bishop of Quebec. He is well known as having, when bishop of Montreal, undertaken an adventurous journey to the Red River settlements, for the purposes of ordination and confirmation. He performed the journey in an open canoe manned by French voyageurs and Indians. They went up the Ottawa, then by wild lakes and rivers into Lake Huron, through the labyrinth of islands in the Georgian Bay, and by the Sault Ste. Marie into Lake Superior, then an almost untraversed sheet of deep, dreary water. Thence they went up the Rainy River, and by almost unknown streams and lakes to their journey's end. They generally rested at night, lighting large fires by their tents, and were tormented by venomous insects. At the mission settlements on the Red River the bishop was received with great delight by the Christianized Indians, who, in neat clothing and with books in their hands, assembled at the little church. The number of persons confirmed was eight hundred and forty-six, and there were likewise two ordinations. The stay of the bishop at the Red River was only three weeks, and he accomplished his enterprising journey of two thousand miles in six weeks. He is one of the most unostentatious persons possible. It was not until he presented me with a volume containing an account of his visitation that I was aware that he was the prelate, with the account of whose zeal and Christian devotedness I had long been familiar. He is now an aged man, and his countenance tells of the love which looks kindly, and the wisdom which looks soberly, on all things. End of chapter 12. Read by Sibella Denton. For more information, please visit LibriVox.org.